Good evening. Uh, welcome everyone uh, in the room and on Zoom to the regular town council meeting of the town of Fairfax for Wednesday, October 4th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. here in the Women's Club and on Zoom. Um, we're also running a special meeting uh, concurrent with this regular meeting, which will um, take place uh, right alongside everything else. Um, I'll call the meeting to order and ask everyone to rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Could I get a roll call, Michelle? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Ackerman? Present. Council Member Hellman? Here. Council Member Blash? Here. Vice Mayor Kohler? Here. And Mayor Cutrano? Present. All present. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, could I get an approval of the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve both agendas. Perfect. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion caller, second Blash. Could I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Ackerman? Yes. Council Member Hellman? Yes. Council Member Blash? Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler? Yes. And Mayor Cutrano? Yes. All ayes. Great. Um, I'll read the land acknowledgement. The Fairfax Town Council acknowledges we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors, past, present, and emerging. Um, I'll now read the meeting protocol. Um, the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. And please put your cell phones in silent or vibrate mode if you can. Um, the town council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any matter not started by 11.30 p.m. will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend this rule. Um, there are no um, closed session announcements. Um, and before we do... Um, public expression, I think it makes sense to, how's council feel about doing um, the presentation before we do open general open time? I agree. Okay, great. Um, and the way I think we'll do that is we'll have Mr. Najaris um, present and then we'll, um, I guess, can get questions from, from council members and then we'll open it up to um, public comment at that time. I also just want to, um, before we actually begin that process, I do want to um, read a prepared statement regarding hate speech. Um, and before we start opening items that will have public comment for this evening's meeting, on behalf of the town council, I'd like to address an issue that several public agencies around California have recently encountered. This includes agencies um, across the North Bay, across the Bay Area, and even closer to home here in Marin, in Larkspur, in Novato, um, and elsewhere. Um, anonymous individuals uh, taking advantage of the remote feature of a public meeting are engaging in the meetings um, in disruptive, uh, with disruptive, irrelevant, or illegal comments. They've launched these attacks uh, at numerous public agency meetings over the past weeks. And I just want to be clear that the town of Fairfax does not condone hate speech in any form. And hate, spe hate speech has no place here in Fairfax. Equity and inclusion are part of our core values and will continually strive to make life better for all members of our community and create an atmosphere where everyone feels a sense of safety and belonging. And with that in mind, um, and with the support and instruction of our legal counsel um, and hearing how other communities across Marin are trying to respond to these attacks, um, we've slightly changed the protocol here. And um, I will 
interrupt any comments that are disruptive to orderly conduct at our meetings. Uh, and if there are any comments in violation of our policies or the law, any comments that, for instance, incite violence um, and are not under the council's subject matter jurisdiction or not relevant to the item being discussed. Uh, and when I do that interruption, I'll just give a warning. Uh, continued dinner, disruption of the meeting will result in a discontinuation of the ability to transmit sound for folks on Zoom. And um, if in person, it may result in removal from the room. Uh, we apologize for the inconvenience. However, we feel it's imperative to take these steps to preserve remote participants' opportunity to speak while also maintaining a safe environment that is in conformance with the law and our policies and allows us to conduct our meeting without disruption. And we ask anyone who wishes to speak um, that you do so with civility, respect, and kindness to others. Um, and that would be much appreciated and help these meetings go far quicker. Um, so with that comment on general public comment and anyone on Zoom who had the intention of coming to just disrupt the meeting, uh, just want to put that out there and we can move forward with the meeting as planned. Um, so with that, I just want to say um, really grateful that we're able to call this special meeting. Thank you so much, Mr. Najaris, for being able to be with us uh, this evening. I also want to give special thanks to um, Interim Chief Mahoney and uh, Chief Tabaranza as well uh, for being able to, and other staff um, from Ross Valley Fire Department for, for being here. Um, heard a lot of comments in the last week or two, uh, especially on next door and things that led to more and more um, engagement with the town council, which is always appreciated, but with the diversity of, of pieces of information and what is or is not happening, you know, information that seems to be dated, it felt really imperative to, to call a special meeting so that we can have a conversation with all the different stakeholders in the room um, and get an update on the countywide strategy to homelessness, which uh, the town of Fairfax participates in. I think that's gonna help everybody have a better sense. I think that's the goal is that everybody comes out of the meeting having a better sense of uh, what we've been working on, what's the current state of play, um, both in the county, but also the county in partnership with Fairfax and what's the, the strategy moving forward to address um, and, to address homelessness in Fairfax and, and in Marin County, but also um, to hopefully end veteran homelessness and family homelessness and chronic homelessness and in the not too um, distant future here. So with that, uh, thank you. And I'll pass it to Mr. Najaris. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council for inviting me to participate. Uh, and share some information at tonight's meeting. Again, my name is Gary Najaris, and I direct homelessness efforts with Health and Human Services at the County of Marin. My comments will just be in four parts. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the big picture of homelessness here in the county. I wanna share some of the successes that we've seen in our system. I think far too often those don't get to get shared. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we're moving forward to continue those successes and then wrap up with kind of what we can all do to help continue progress towards ending homelessness in Marin. So starting with the big picture, housing affordability really remains the biggest obstacle to addressing homelessness here in Marin, similar to other cities and counties and states across our country. A majority, 78%, of people who are experiencing homelessness in Marin lived here and had a Marin address before they lost their housing. This is an even higher per percentage than in previous point in time counts um, that we did. This has gone from 73% to 78% in the most recent point in time count. So our fellow residents who are homeless, our neighbors, our family, our friends, um, and part of our communities. Homelessness is more visible than in previous years. This visibility is largely not related to significant increases in homelessness. Rather, residents and residents of encampments are known to the homeless system of care, and the vast majority have been homeless in Marin for years. 
a series of federal court decisions have limited jurisdictional authority at all levels to require individuals to quote unquote move along, um, resulting in more highly visible encampments. And what persons who have lived experience of homelessness tell us is that they often gather in encampments to find safety, security, and connection with one another. The same as really any of us would do um, with our neighbors um, and to be together as a community. Our county operates a coordinated continuum of care that includes housing-focused shelter, rapid rehousing, outreach, housing-based case management, and permanent supportive housing. That's a lot of jargon. <laughs> Just let me explain a little bit about what each of those things are. Housing-focused shelter is shelter where once an individual enters, they must be actively engaged in a process to move towards permanent housing. So we don't have folks enter shelter just for a night or for a week or for a month. Um, when folks enter our shelters, our shelter system, they're able to remain there for as long as it takes for them to get housed. Um, and our partners at Homeward Bound tell us that in some of the shelters that they run, that can be upwards of sometimes 300 days that, that folks are sheltered. But the good news is that folks are exiting from that shelter to housing and not back onto the street. Uh, rapid rehousing means individuals who may be homeless for a short period of time may have been doubled up in their housing previously, um, may have been living with someone who asked them to leave, um, they may have a job or some other source of income, but they need a little bit of a helping hand to be able to get established into a rental unit. That might include support with a security deposit or first and last month's rent, or even six or a year's worth of rent support. Um, but the person is able to then stabilize into the, and afford that apartment on their own moving forward. Outreach, um, we have teams uh, of outreach folks. Um, there's a variety of agencies we work with. Outreach is focused on various geographic areas of the county, Central Marin, Southern Marin, um, San Rafael, Novato. So um, outreach teams are very familiar with folks in many locations. And although encampments may be very visible, there are a lot of individuals who are homeless um, out on the streets who you don't see on a regular basis. And our outreach teams are uniquely good um, at being able to uh, find where folks are uh, and engage with folks. Outreach teams help folks with anything that they might need from helping to get documentation, if they've lost their driver's license or their birth certificate from living on the street, they want to get connected to mental health or social services. Um, they want to get reunited with family. Whatever the need might be, outreach workers are poised to be able to help folks with those needs. Housing-based case management, bless you. Housing-based case management is uh, a case manager, usually an individual that carries a caseload of about 17 clients. Um, that person's job in addition to meeting any of those kinds of needs, just like an outreach worker would, um, one of the unique focuses of a housing-based case manager is to move an individual forward on a pathway to housing, whatever that housing opportunity might be. Um, it may be helping them with rapid rehousing supports. It may be helping them reunite with family or friends. It may be helping to apply for Section 8 um, and, and get settled into a unit. In our county, you must have a housing-based case manager to apply for Section 8. Um, so it's a limited resource um, that we need a lot more of. Um, and our Board of Supervisors has been uniquely supportive um, in expanding our housing-based case management system over the years. And finally, the strategies that Marin has implemented since 2017, some of you have heard the philosophy of housing first um, or things like permanent supportive housing are based in evidence and science and in practice. Um, and they continue to be very successful. And I want to just define housing first for a second, because sometimes when we use that term, it can sound like we mean we only work on housing with individuals. Um, all housing first means is that there are no preconditions 
for someone to get into housing. People don't have people who are homeless don't have to earn housing. Housing is not a reward. Housing is a fundamental human right. And so the goal is to get someone into a stable and safe and permanent housing destination. Evidence shows that folks are uniquely better positioned to deal with any of the issues in their life from gaining employment to dealing with behavioral health issues to whatever their goals might be if they have a safe and permanent place to come home to. So that's all. We work with clients on anything they ask us to work on, um, but a housing first model just says our goal is to get you stably placed in housing as soon as possible in addition to anything else we might be working on with you. So some successes, and sorry, there's a bunch of numbers here, but I'll try to be clear as I go through them. In the last five years, um, since we transformed our system, we have served 2,090 unique individuals in our shelter system. That is huge um, for a county of our size. Our shelter system is made up of 161 beds on any given day across six sites, some of which are specialized for individuals and some of which are specialized for families. So to have 161 beds and serve two, over 2,000 individuals is a testament to the success of our partner organizations like Homeward Bound um, and others who are uniquely able to move folks through that system and, and into housing. We also have up to 67 additional shelter beds for emergency situations. These are normally things like our severe weather emergency shelter that you might be familiar with when there's extreme cold um, or multiple days of intense rain events. Um, we also have some em emergency supports for families that might find themselves in an emergency situation. In the last five years, we've connected over 1,400 individuals to a permanent housing destination. And again, that would not be possible without the array of community-based organizations and others who do this work uh, on a daily basis without fatigue or fail. Um, <clears throat> this includes over 800 people who only needed short supports like that or um, brief supports like that rapid rehousing um, or reunification with family or other things. So a significant number of folks that we help find a permanent housing destination really only require um, a less intensive level of support um, for a brief amount of time. In addition, 600 and we've housed 649 disabled people who have had long histories of homelessness, a term we call chronic homelessness. And it's important to understand that to meet that definition, it's not just that you have to be homeless for more than a year, but you have to have some type of disabling condition. So this is the most complex population to work with on the streets. And frankly, in the past, a lot of communities and states have avoided working with this population because of how challenging it can be. Um, when Marin um, re redefined its system in 2017, it defined this population as top priority so that folks who have, who are disabled and who've had these long experiences of homelessness can get into what we call permanent supportive housing. These folks are matched with one of those permanent supportive housing case managers. That case manager stays with the person from the day they meet them while they're homeless through to getting housed and into the future for as long as that person needs support. 94% of those 649 people are still housed today. And this is an extraordinary success rate for our county. Nationally, the numbers are in the low 80s. Um, of being able to retain folks in housing. So we are far exceeding. It means that the work of our housing-based case managers from the community-based organizations we work with are doing that work on a day-to-day -day basis to assure the person remains stable and in that housing and does not return to the streets. We continue to permanently house on average 10 chronically homeless people each month. And that is an amazing pace considering the size of our county and the investments we have. In addition, 99 veterans have been housed 
I was hoping that would be a hundred before we, <laughs> before we had the meeting, uh, 99 veterans, uh, have been housed, uh, since 2017, there are approximately 28 veterans remaining on the streets in Marin. Homeward Bound is currently building housing that will have 24 units specifically dedicated to veterans. Once that opens, it will effectively end veteran homelessness in Marin. And we will be one of only a less than handful of counties in California to achieve that milestone when it happens. And what, what that functional end to homelessness means is that if someone does enter the system who is a veteran, that their experience of homelessness will be brief because the resources will be there to be able to get them connected to housing. In addition, since 2017, we've housed 179 families. And in Marin, approximately 21 unsheltered and 40 sheltered families remain. And again, that statistic, 66% of our families who are homeless in Marin are in shelter. We want to continue to expand that, and we hope to achieve within a few years a functional end to family homelessness as well. There's still work to be done. Approximately 876 individuals remain prioritized for housing in our system out of 1,500 people that we've had contact with and we have information on in our system. Within the confines of fair housing law, it's important to understand that our system has to serve people with the highest level of vulnerability first. We cannot geographically or otherwise target individuals for housing services. So I know when we all see encampments in the community, we often wonder, that encampment isn't too large. There's only a handful of people there. Why can't we get them housed? As housing Section 8 vouchers and housing units open up in the county, we are drawing from that list of 876 folks who are prioritized with the most vulnerable up towards the front of that list. So. As I said a moment ago, you know, of the average of 10 that we're housing each month, those 10 might come from almost every geographic location in the county. So that's why it can appear that the it takes a really long time for particular encampments to grow smaller, um, but know that we are consistently having success with housing folks on a, on a monthly basis. Um, so how are we moving forward and kind of keeping up that success? Uh, we've been, the county has been, great at leveraging federal and state emergency funding during COVID-19. We have since 2017, we have over 390 new permanent supportive housing units across the county. And those are in two kinds of locations. One we call scattered site, one we call single site. Scattered site just means it's a regular apartment in any kind of apartment building across the county. That is where the majority of our 726 beds of housing are. Over 500 plus of them are just scattered in apartment buildings, in you know everything from folks who just have two units that they're renting all the way up to buildings that have 200 units. It's critical that folks are able to be integrated back into the community um, where possible and where they are well positioned to be able to successfully live independently. We also have a large number of sites that we call single site. These are buildings that are specifically dedicated to housing homeless folks, sometimes by population, like Homeward Bound's new veterans housing, sometimes um, by need, you know, might be for folks who have behavioral health issues. Sometimes it's for families, sometimes it's for young people. Um, home key which I'm sure folks have heard a lot about <laughs> across California. Um, we've been really successful. We've had two home key round one projects, uh, 18 new units at La Casa Buena in Corte Madera and 40 units at 3301 Kerner. In addition, we were able to use the 3301 Kerner building as temporary shelter space while Homeward Bound rebuilt. Um, their old shelter and expanded it, which now has 42 shelter beds and 32 permanent supportive housing units. Previously, it had only been a shelter. Um, <clears throat> in home key round two, we were successful 
um, in bringing on 43 new units at 1251 South Elysio. And I'm happy to say that 1251 opened up at the beginning of September and clients have already been moving in and absolutely love the space. Um, we also have a home key round three application for a 26 unit building um, for individuals who are homeless um, and working. So it's going to be workforce housing, and that's going to be at the Homeward Bound campus and in Novato. And Homeward Bound will support those individuals in their workforce efforts um, through the programs that they already have. We've also been exceptional in Marin at utilizing additional Section 8 vouchers that were available um, to communities. Since 2017, we've utilized 396 Section 8 vouchers here in Marin. Of those, 207 individuals will, were um, served with vouchers that were awarded through five separate rounds of competitive process with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So HUD, when there are unused vouchers in certain parts of the country, HUD will um, announce a competitive process and allow communities that need vouchers to be able to compete for those. Um, to be able to compete, you first have to have used any vouchers that you may have been previously awarded in any competitive rounds. So they can't be hanging around. And I think this is a testament to the work of our Marin Housing Authority and all of our community-based organizations in the effectiveness of being able to match folks um, and with housing units um, and get these utilized. Uh, we hope that HUD will continue this program because we certainly want to keep using them. Um, we also have uh, served 117 individuals for something through something called an emergency housing voucher. This was something that was specific just to the pandemic to help get folks indoors um, and housed. We've also um, worked really hard to find innovative, innovative ways to accelerate pathways to housing. So the Marin Housing Authority and the county have a collaboration right now to support up to 10 individuals um, with rent support in housing um, while awaiting Section 8 vouchers. So there are times, even though we're good at, at utilizing vouchers and getting new ones, um, there are times when there are none available. Um, and there might be actual apartments and units out there ready for someone to move in. We don't wanna pass up that opportunity. Um, we wanna get someone from the street into a unit if at all possible. So this is a temporary government sponsored rent support program to help someone for up to a year while they're waiting on that section eight voucher to come through. The Richardson Bay Regional Authority and the county um, have also used this model for folks who are moving off the water and they've created a program that has support for up to 17 individuals. Um, and that support can be up, uh, that temporary rental support can be up to three years as those folks are transitioning from the boats on the water um, into a permanent housing destination. We've also been successful in um, lobbying the state um, for some support um, for the work that our communities are doing. So the Cities of Novato, San Rafael, and Sausalito, together with the county, were able to get 1.5 million in state surplus funds last year. Um, the county matched that 1.5 million. So each of those communities received $1 million to be able to address encampments locally and support pathways to housing. Uh, we've also been extremely successful at um, getting encampment resolution funds um, from the state as well. Uh, round one, the city of Novato got an encampment resolution fund in partnership with the county to help folks at Lee Gurner Park um, and the city of San Rafael got an award to help folks in the former support services area. Uh, round two. Could was you just explain what that is, what a, a resolution and encampment resolution is? Sure. So encampment resolution funding our funds directly from the state to be able to help a community to literally resolve an encampment. The goal is that once you have those dollars, um, a clock starts ticking and you have 36 months um, to get folks housed uh, and connected to house, to a permanent housing destination. And so funds are used to support housing-based case managers, sometimes rental support, that rapid rehousing support I was talking about earlier, direct client needs. It can be 
uh, if we know that an apartment is available in a month and there's a section eight voucher that the client has in hand, we'll put them in a motel for a month, you know, with some of those funds so they can get off the street and start making that transition. So whatever it takes to really help, um, that encampment, the intention is that by the end of that grant, the encampment is resolved. It's no longer there. Um, so it's a service and support oriented way to ensure that folks get connected to housing rather than just simply asking folks to move to different parts of town being outside. Um, in the second round, which a lot of you probably heard about recently, um, the county got an award um, for the Binford Road RV encampment. Um, the county also received an award in collaboration with the city of Novato for the Hamilton Marsh encampment. Um, and San Rafael received another award to help address the Mahone Path encampment. Um, and so our goal there, which I th I'm sure you've heard a lot about at some recent Board of Supervisors meetings, is now we're on a 36-month clock with places like Binford Road and others to assure that folks there um, get connected to a housing destination. The next round of those funds um, is coming out this fall. Um, normally, the state prioritizes larger encampments. Um, and encampments that are in uh, Caltrans right-of-ways, so underneath or adjacent to highways or other places, but it does not mean that um, folks shouldn't apply, you know, if their encampments are smaller. So the county is always happy to partner with communities, um, you know, who are addressing encampments locally. And then finally, um, under the innovative category, the county and cities have gotten together um, on another program for individuals who have high utilization of city services. So this is a program where we, um, the county and cities all jointly contributed to uh, a $2 million fund to hire um, a set of housing-based case managers that would carry caseloads that were geographically specific. Uh, there's a Nevada one, a San Rafael, a Central Marin, and a Southern Marin. Um, and each community is able to identify individuals um, that are the highest utilizers of their municipal city services. That can be police, fire, that can be EMS, that can be anything. Um, it's the city's determination of who gets into that program. So this was a way, again, as I explained before, our, our system works on prioritizing individuals with the highest vulnerability. The highest utilizers of city services might not be the highest vulnerable folks, but because that's a locally funded program, we can run it differently than our regular system of care. And so cities were able to identify folks who were um, the highest utilizers, um, and we've successfully uh, moved over half of those folks already into housing uh, and others are at various stages of that housing pathway. That was a three-year program and we believe that we will um, house all 68 individuals that were sponsored through that program prior to the end of the three years. So what can we all do to wrap up? So the county is continuing and committed to securing more funding and continuing to create more partnerships, um, continuing to look at innovative strategies um, to partner with communities. We've collaborated across county departments. Um, you can imagine we're heavily involved with the Community Development Agency, the Department of Public Works, the Sheriff's Office, but even parks um, and, and others um, we've developed unique partnerships with. Um, we're proud of our innovative partnerships with cities to collaboratively address local issues and the work that the county has been able to do to fund and build more housing, as well as provide case management and the public health, behavioral health and social services necessary to ensure clients are successful. Cities have been amazing partners um, in this work and can continue their successful efforts to build more housing at the low and very low income levels to enact policies that prevent individuals from falling into homelessness, coordinate safe and supportive responses to encampments, and even help incentivize landlords to take homeless folks with Section 8. The Marin Housing Authority has something called the Landlord Incentive Program. It provides additional supports to landlords beyond just the Section 8 voucher um, to incentivize folks to take clients who are formerly experiencing homelessness. 
It helps to cover costs if there are damages to the units or other things, but the Housing Authority has a great page on that Landlord Incentive Program. And anyone who is a landlord um, should check it out because it's a, a, a number of the landlords who have participated um, have been very happy with the additional supports that they've gotten through that program. And what can a member of the public do? If you see someone homeless that you're concerned about, if there's an emergency situation, and we mean emergencies, you know, you can call 911. So that's a threat, you know, to people or property. Um, but if you think the person just needs assistance or needs help, or you're seeing someone new in a location that you haven't seen before, it's good to let us know um, because we can ensure that outreach teams stay connected to that person um, and continue to move them on that housing pathway. And the best way to do that is to call our office at 415-473-HOME, H-O-M-E. Unfortunately, and I know this is less than satisfying sometimes to folks who call in, confidentiality protections prevent us from being able to report back to you what hap what's happening with the individual. So we can't call you back even if you're an elected official <laughs> and say, we've engaged with the person or here's where they're at on their housing pathway, or we've connected them to services. Um, and the process may take some time, but know that when you do report to us, we do immediately go out and engage. Often the person is already known to us. Sometimes it might be they're in a new location and we maybe haven't seen them in a week or two. Um, so it's always good to know, especially if someone's showing up in a new location. Um, but just know we are following up on everyone that we can get our hands on. Um, I think as, te as testified by the you know over 1500 folks that are um, in our system. Uh, so with that concludes my presentation and happy to address any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, opening it up to my colleagues for questions. There's a lot of information. Yeah, please. Thank you so much for that and for being here this evening. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, if you could just refresh me on how it works um, and, and helping me with some of the numbers that you provided. So um, the 1,500 people that are unhoused in the counties, that's roughly the current state. Is that right? So, uh, you know, and we should, I, I should specify, we have information on 1500 people in our system. Some folks, um, do ex we experience what's called loss to follow up sometimes. So we may see someone in a community, we may get their information, we enter them into our system, but the next time we go out there or even for months afterwards, the person is not able to be found. Sometimes folks leave the county, they right. reunite on their own. So we have 15 information on 1500 folks, but um, about 876 that are prioritized um, for services. And the 876 of the, you know, 1500 that you ha at one point had information on and they could have um, moved elsewhere or become housed, hopefully. Um the, 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 those folks are those technically folks that have that have said yes I want to be you know in the system if you will that they have case management I'm trying to understand the, like the case management number it's a great question um we unfortunately do not uh, um have the resources to be able to case manage all 876 folks okay um our, our case management case loads uh, uh, capacity is much lower than that. Um, it, it's pretty much prioritized for folks who are towards the front of the system. Again, folks who are disabled, who have been homeless for the longest periods of time. That's where that service gets matched. It's entirely possible that that someone on the you know upper end of that 876 has been homeless for a week or two, is someone that's taking advantage of services like rapid rehousing or other things. So it doesn't mean we wait to serve them. It just means different services get applied for different needs within that list. Okay. And then how does it work for a newly uh, discovered 
highly vulnerable individual, how does that how does the system work or the process work to get them prioritized? So um, what outreach teams, if they encounter someone who's not in our system, will meet with that client often multiple times to get to know them. There's a series of vulnerability assessments and other tools that we use to be able to help understand a person's vulnerability and their situation, as well as their needs and the things that they want to work on. So um, then, you know, that's channeled through our coordinated entry system. And then that person is incorporated into that list. So it's entirely possible, you know, we may encounter someone who is not disabled and has very low vulnerability and has only been homeless for two weeks. We may also find someone who has been homeless for three years and is disabled and is highly vulnerable and then moves up, you know, to the front of our system. Okay. Thank you. Um, and currently it was, it was really helpful to know all the, num the number of beds and the number of sites and so forth. There's no vacancy currently. Is that correct? Uh, vacancies in our shelter system are rare. Um, and they are filled quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Homeward Bound has a regular routine weekly process where, um, you know, because sometimes folks leave shelter for various reasons. Um, if there are openings, um, clients can refer themselves to those openings. Case managers can refer or a concerned person can, can refer as well to Homeward Bound's shelter system. And they assess you know, and bring in folks whenever there's an open bed. And so what is the time, what does the, the horizon look like in terms of it's, it's sounds like there's home key three on the way, et cetera, but as far as shelters and other support systems, like housing support, what's on the short and long-term horizon and what can we be advocating for in terms of, you know, the, the, the board of supervisors and our senators and so forth, like what, what else, what, what funding, if you had, if you had your wish list, like where, where do we prioritize funding if funding weren't an issue? That's a great question. I think I would always work backwards from what the most successful interventions are. Um, I know sometimes, you know, we see things in the news like, oh, there's a company that for a million dollars can come in and put tough sheds in a parking lot, you know, but I think we always want to work backwards from the most successful interventions for folks. So if we can make housing units available, um, if we can build and bring online more housing units, if we can get landlords to be willing to rent and engage with our population, we always want to start with a permanent housing destination for folks and work backwards from that. So more units is always the best expansion that we can make in the system. Um, prior to that, getting more housing-based case management services, because pairing someone with a housing-based case manager who's disabled um, and had a long experience of homelessness, as I said, that's a requirement to get in the Section 8 process for our homelessness vouchers. So an essential resource that together, you know, even we as county and cities, you know, helped fund with that uh, program for individuals who had high utilization uh, of city services, which were, which caused a significant resource drain on small communities. Um, then I would say working backwards from that would be to expand, you know, housing focused shelter. And I think that's the critical piece is that you don't want to create shelter. That's just, you stay for a night, you know, um, you want to create shelter that, um, has the right services and supports so that folks engage in a housing pathway while they're there. And then more outreach. I think being able to continue the, the work of our outreach teams is challenging. Um, they, they interact with a lot of clients on a regular basis and being able to expand, you know, those teams, um, and the resources they have, um, other short-term your you know, smaller things, these unique rental assistance programs that we've, that RBRA and the Marin Housing Authority has come up with that the County has come up with, it costs about, you know, to, to house a person given the area median rent, you know, here in Marin, 
for someone is about 28 to 30 K a year. And so having even a small amount of money set aside that helps folks get into available housing units when there are not Section 8 vouchers available and bridge that gap of time so folks don't have to be on the street while they're awaiting that resource and support um, is really creative support. And then thing and then helping with you know rapid rehousing supports. Um, you know, that first and last month's rent, that that short-term rental assistance um, for folks. And I think communities are also uniquely positioned to help with homelessness prevention. I think uh, some of you may have seen some of the work that Front Porch Services has been doing around home match um, really successfully in the city. I think there was an even an article about two of our municipalities that have engaged um, with them recently. Sometimes what our older adults who are on fixed income need is sometimes only a couple of hundred dollars a month to bridge that gap between the rent increase that they just received of 10%, you know, and their fixed income um, to be able to help them remain in housing. Um, sometimes that can stabilize over time, but often, you know, that means a longer term commitment, but it can help with older adults, um, especially until other services like home matching or roommate matching, like can help get them connected to, to other resources that help stabilize that rent. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, following up on that, um, is that a program that like small municipalities would implement or is it something that's more at the county level? Is that the shallow rental subsidies? Yeah, that's shallow rental subsidies. And I think anyone can be supportive of that you know, from the county to communities, to, you know, private funders, to um, to even uh, some of our, you know, municipal service organizations, you know, in our communities that, that want to help. Um, sometimes a, a very small amount of money can go a long way for our older adults. Yeah. And I guess I'm wondering, is that different from what's offered by like St. Vincent's or Community Action Marin? Is it something that a municipality administers or a nonprofit? How is it or any of the, of the above? Yeah, it's a, so, you know, I think it would require, you know, coordination with a with an organization like Front Porch or others, you know, who are, you know, St. Vincent's or others who may be um, doing that work. Uh, you, the work I think you're referring to with Community Action Marin is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program um, that uh, where there were some federal and state funds to be able to help fo prevent folks from getting displaced, um, especially due to falling behind in rent during the pandemic when a lot of people weren't working. Unfortunately, that's coming to a close. But yes, partnering with some of our community-based organizations would be an excellent way to, to help support some of those efforts. Okay. Um, that has something that's been of interest to me um, with some things that have emerged in the community and probably many other communities. Um, you know, everybody um, has a great fondness for tiny homes. And I hear people often say, well, why can't we just, you know, build some tiny homes and put people in there? Um, why is or isn't that a, a good or successful model? That's a great question. And I think, you know, I, I was trying to avoid jargon in my presentation. I probably was not 100% successful, but I think that like in the homelessness field, there there is a lot of jargon. Um, and sometimes when people say tiny homes, sometimes what they mean are tough sheds in a parking lot that are being used as shelter. And I think that's qualitatively a different thing um, than what a tiny home could be. Um, it is a strategy that, that has had some success in some communities. It has also been challenging, um, in a number of others. We've seen counties, you know, like Sonoma and San Mateo and, and others who have set up some of these tough shed villages, um, with the intention of, you know, better to have someone in one of these tough sheds than on the street. And it is an excellent intention but what that needs to be paired with is housing-based case management and other services that actually help someone move on a pathway to housing. What we've seen is that a lot of times folks can languish in some of those sites um, and not move forward in the process. And it can get really expensive really fast. We've also seen it with some, you know, folks also say, what about, you know, put a RVs in a parking lot? you know, and, and just have everybody together and you can deliver all the services together. Communities have also seen very escalating costs, you know, with trying to do something like that as well. If what we mean are true tiny homes that would meet 
the Department of Housing and Urban Development's um, definition of a home, then that's a qualitatively different idea. So in Livermore, for example, they have a, a program called Goodness Village. It was a religious organization that donated uh, an acre of their property, and they brought in actual trailer units that meet the de that definition of housing. They have kitchens, they have private bathrooms, they have a sleeping area. They don't have to be huge, but they do need to meet a certain um, list of criteria. They also have to be hooked up to plumbing, septic, electricity, all those other things. They were able to bring a number of those actual tiny homes onto that one acre property, um, community uh, organizations donated, you know, planted gardens, strung lights, um, provide services. Um, it truly is home for those people. That is a permanent housing destination. And so there are some creative ideas out there where we can do something like that. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And just a couple of others. So um, we're talking about the, that there's this sort of preclusion of geographic targeting because of fair housing laws, which I understand, but I'm wondering, is that specific to Marin because we have the situation we have, or is that statewide? That's a federal. That's a federal thing. Yeah, okay. Due to fair housing. Right. Area. Okay. And then, so that what confused me a little is then it seemed like the encampment resolution funds were geographically targeted, like say for Binford Road. So is that, I assume there are shades of gray in here, but yeah, it depends on um, where the funding comes from. So the majority of the funding in our system comes from the federal level or through the state from the feds. And so subject to those fair housing requirements, but there are some funding pots like the encampment resolution fund and like our local program for individuals who are high utilizers of municipal services where we can do that. So that's where some of that innovation can come into play. Great. And then I um, have one more, um, a couple more actually. Well, I'm wondering what, um, you know, so we are in a different position, obviously, than San Rafael or Nevada. We're a small, very small jurisdiction um, with limited resources. And then we collaborate with the county. Um, you know, our, our, what else do we do as a small community? Um, because it seems like, you know, I've gone to conferences and things and have, people have these amazing suggestions, but they seem really applicable to a larger community that has a lot of land and facilities and more funding. Um, are there specific strategies for small towns, very small towns? That is a great question. I think that definitely requires some ongoing conversation and brainstorming. But I think that, you know, a couple of the ones that we've done together, like, you know, the the individuals who are high utilizers of municipal services was a really unique innovation, I think, locally. Um, every community has a housing element now that, that needs to be implemented, which includes, you know, I think special attention to low income and very low income housing, um, which would be helpful for folks you know, someone with a Section 8 voucher is going to be paying probably the market rate rent. But for other folks, you know, who are in the system, who maybe whose income is maybe just really low, you know, and needs to be able to find those kinds of units, I think continued support from local communities to assure those kinds of units get built. Um, but I think there's still a lot of creativity out there and, um, you know, excited to continue the conversations um, you know, with all of our communities to find what some more of those are. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Yeah. yeah um, we had a presentation a, over a year ago from one of your colleagues, I believe. And at the time, I think um, jumping on what Liesl talked about, which is tiny homes where people think they're an easy answer, potentially. Um, I believe at that time she talked about that they are much higher costs than just building typical units. Is that correct? And just one thing I wanted to follow on, I've heard stories that Los Angeles has ended their veterans' um, homelessness, and I've seen it. It's They're not homes. It's on the veterans' property near Beverly Hills that used to be full of encampments, and they're not even tough sheds. They're much smaller than that, and there may be anywhere up from five to 600 of these little places to sleep, that's not a tiny home. Right. And can you speak to kind of the cost? Because I think to the extent that we have the ability to help and our housing element does uh, address the ability to allow tiny homes, which wasn't allowed before, kind of like to hear your feeling on how much more expensive are they than actually just 
building very low, low income housing. And this may not be your area of expertise. Um, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. We did an analysis at the time that the county and some law enforcement and community partners went up to visit the Los Gilicos village um, in Sonoma. So that was one of those larger kind of tough shed villages um, next to the highway. They're often not located in optimal areas, um, as you were saying, but um, but you know, if really you're using them for you know truly temporary housing focused shelter and you're moving folks through, I think what the cost that we were talking about at the time is when we did an analysis of everything from the cost to obtain the units themselves um, to the cost to be able to do the, the plumbing, the electrical, the hookups for everything, to maintain that month after month um, for some for sometimes years at a time, to be able to provide the security, the on-site staffing, you know, never mind even all the housing-based case management and services. It's cheaper just to get someone into a housing unit um, and even help them with temporary rent support, like some of these innovative programs, than it is to do that. You know, and I think that was the comparison that that we were making at the well, time is that if we have limited funds, which we all do, you know, those those limited funds are best spent to support someone in a permanent housing destination versus a temporary one like that. Well, that that's good, you know, information to get out there because there really is this sort of idea, like you just put people in a bunch of little tiny homes and it's all fixed and it's not. I just want to mention that during COVID, we had a small rental assistance program that we did through Fairfax and we worked with St. Vinny's and uh, Community Action Marin to distribute those funds for us. Um, which was a small thing that we could do when the county was having trouble getting funding out and we targeted it towards Fairfax. So we did develop relationships at that time, which we could capitalize in the future for some of these creative ideas. Okay. Any thoughts on that? Just an enormous thank you for doing it. <laughs> That's an amazing program. And I think, you know, it really um, highlights how a municipality is able to then focus efforts on its own residents. I think when we do things at the county level, we always have to look at the county as a whole um, and prioritize based on need, whatever those programs are, like emergency rental assistance or our, our coordinated entry system. But when a municipality has the ability to do something of any size, you know, it, you're you're much better positioned to be able to to assist your own residents, which I think is an enormous plus. Yeah, and that was a that was a good thing for us because we really wanted to focus it on people in Fairfax, and you can't do that with the county programs, right. particularly if they're getting federal money. Exactly. So thank you. That was a great presentation. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Councilmember Ackerman? Oh no, I just want to thank thank you for your presentation and thank you, Mayor Catrano, for arranging this. This is very helpful. Yeah, and absolutely. Helpful. Yeah, yeah, and I want to get to the public um, who've been waiting patiently too. Just a, I had a couple quick questions. Like we talk about this overarching system, and it's so challenging because you're dealing with unique individuals that are on different timelines and have their own, you know, individual plans and things that case managers are trying to align with. Um, but in terms of like the the nuts and bolts of some of these things, like going after an encampment resolution funding stream of some sort. You mentioned the 36 month shot clock. Just curious what, at the end of that, like if there are still folks that are unhoused or in a place like Fairfax, where, you know, a year ago, we we're having a conversation about a set of folks that have since been housed. And now we're talking about a completely different set of folks. And, and it's not clear when the public is seeing unhoused folks in our community, like, um, that piece of it, but uh, what what are the strings attached with achieving or not achieving that thirty six month piece uh, of it? Is it you have to pay money back, or what's you know? That is a great question. <laughs> um, I would have to look a little bit more into the grant itself around that. Fortunately, the the grants that we've had. Um, we've been really successful um, in being able to do that. I think to the point where even some communities that have had more structured encampments, um, which are safer places to be, um, have decided that they may want to 
cycle additional folks through there, you know, for similar mm. types of supports. Mm -hmm. So I think that what's critical with these particular grants is, you know, what's your census, you know, at the time, who are you getting, you know, how do you know who's there and, and who they are and what their needs are? And then how are you addressing those as you move forward? Got it. So it's specific to that point in time when you're getting those funds, it's for the number of folks that are currently there. And if, and, you know, you can get those folks housed, um, but you can still use that site or use that to cycle other folks through without jeopardizing the funding. Is that? that that's what one of our communities has done and it seems to be working so far. So, yeah. okay. But I can get you further detailed information on that because it is a great question. Like, yeah. What it, happens if we don't achieve the, <laughs> the amount? Yeah. I mean, that's let's, a great question. Yeah. That's like worst case scenario. Right. But good to know what the fallout would be in that circumstance. Right. Um, I think a number of communities also have, um, when they structure their encampments, I think we saw, you know, in Sausalito, Novato, San Rafael with the sports service area, like really try to define, you know, as of this time, here's who's here, you know, and either we're not admitting new residents like into this structured encampment, or if we do like, here's how they get connected to different resources. Great. Um, thank you. And I'm oh, sorry, two quick questions on that general topic or, okay, I'll, let me, um, ask these two and then we'll go back and then go to the public. Um, so the other thing on, on vouchers. So just to clarify when the federal government awards us vouchers in a cycle or however that, that plays out, do those vouchers then stay with I guess, Marin Housing Authority or with, with the county moving forward? Um, or do we do we gain vouchers over time? Or, or like, what's what does that look like? Because it feels like that's a pretty, Section 8 vouchers are pretty valuable. Right. So there, basically, there's three kinds in the county right now. So as folks may be familiar with, our Section 8 wait list has not been open since 2008. So um, the question becomes, where do we get these vouchers from? Um, so there is something that happens with the Section 8, um, this, the Section 8 program called turnover. It might be someone exits, they might move on because they've had a Section 8 voucher that has helped them to stabilize. They've done things like get a job, get an education, um, connect with family, whatever it might be. And there is a program actually called Moving On, um, you know, where folks move out of public housing, out of using a Section 8 voucher, whatever it might be. Um, and that in turn can make some a very limited amount of vouchers available. Our housing authority has committed to setting a, a small amount of those no more than 50, um, dedicated to helping folks who are homeless get housed. Um, there are some dedicated for other purposes as well. Basically what it does is your being homeless brings you to the top of the Section 8 list. So when that turnover happens, if you're eligible, um, then that's where some of our vouchers come from. The competitive vouchers that we've gotten mm -hmm. from Housing and Urban Development, those get added to our system. Um, if a person exits one of those vouchers, um, that can turn over for someone else in Marin. Sometimes it's for other homeless folks. Um, the third kind is the emergency housing voucher, the one that was pandemic specific. So those had to be utilized before the end of this federal fiscal, the previous federal fiscal year was just to happen September 30th. Um, if someone exits one of those vouchers, it does not recycle back through our system. So that was a one-time thing. So we really tried to focus those on folks who we thought would make permanent use of them. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then there's a lot of conversation about shelter beds versus permanent housing or permanent supportive housing or things like that. I'm curious, um, what the cost differential is like as a community, if we wanted to put money towards building more, getting more shelter beds online in Marin County or something like that. Um, it's not clear to me um, as the, the, the length of stay has increased over time, it ends up kind of feeling like it's housing. It's just not permanent housing. So then you still need to build permanent housing, but I, it's not clear what the, 
if it's if it's cost effective or how the numbers stack up. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, that is a great question, and I think you know some of our shelter partners may be better equipped to to answer that than I. So I think we should follow up with that. But I think in general, um, the shift to housing focused shelter in our system is really an evidence based practice across the country. You know, we don't want folks cycling in and out daily or weekly between the street and shelter. Like if a person wants to engage. So folks engage, you know, on a housing pathway in a number of ways. Someone could be on the street, engaged with a housing-based case manager and working directly on that housing pathway. Someone could be in our housing focused shelter and engaged with those, those same kind of housing-based case management services there and on that pathway to housing. Um, we would love to get, you know, as many folks indoors as we can in our system. And I think having a housing focused shelter system really helps to ensure that um, that you're using the beds that you have to the maximum extent for that successful outcome for folks. But I think I'm, I'm sure our shelter partners can put it a lot better than I can. So we'll, we'll do some follow up with you. Got it. Thank you. And then um, last thing that I have uh so it's clear that one way that the, our, a town of our size in this community can contribute has been the way that we've put forward some of our ARPA dollars or put monies forward in the past, which is increasing case management. Um, the, the shallow rent subsidy item that Councilmember Blash was just alluding to, I'm curious about the efficacy, like um, how long, like if if there are people in our community that are unhoused, neighbors, friends, and we want to pair them up with a unit and provide shallow rent subsidies, similar to the rental assistance program that we did during COVID, um, there's probably then a question that comes after, like how long does that last for? So do, do you have any like anecdotal data about what that looks like? It's it's very valuable to get someone in shelter or like get them housed um, so that the, they can stabilize there and get services there. But I'm not sure how long that, how, how long a, a fund would be on the hook for, for paying somebody's rent, rent subsidies, you know? It's a great question. I think, again, I think our partners at Front Porch, you know, would probably be much better able to, to talk about that um, than I. They're definitely the experts in that field. But I, you know, I think one of the things that we, where we tried to fill the gap you know, as the county and and what RBRA did as well was to to you know we we really took a look at the system and said you know where are we seeing an issue at some stages, and when there are no Section Eight vouchers available, sometimes there are rental units available, and so we were saying that seems silly, you know, to have a rental unit not be able to be occupied by someone you know, who's homeless, who's qualified for a Section 8 voucher, who's on that pathway, who we're pretty sure is, you know, 99% sure is going to obtain it at the end of the process, which can take a little bit of time, um, but there just aren't any available right now. That's where we saw a gap and said, you know, if we could support, you know, we said maybe up to a year, because given the turnover of vouchers that I was talking about and some of those successful competitive ones that we get, we thought, you know, if there were a pilot set of folks that we could try this with, um, really target it towards those moments, like we're approaching now, <laughs> um, where there's not vouchers available, um, but potentially units, you know, is a great opportunity to be able to say, like, let's get the person off the street, even if it's it, it might be three months, it might be six months. Different folks may have varying lengths of time that they need to be covered but it's all in anticipation of that successful voucher coming through. So there's an end, you know, to that process. I think that was an example of an innovation, you know, around a specific gap that we tried to close. And we're happy to continue brainstorming, you know, with communities to think about what are some of the other ones. Great. Thank you. And Councilmember Helen. Yeah. Could you just confirm that there are homeless individuals in all of the jurisdictions across Maroon? Is that an accurate statement? Oh. Yes, um, according to our point in time count, yes, except at the time of the point in time count, we didn't find anyone in Ross, but um, but everywhere else, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That doesn't mean there isn't anyone there, sure. but we we didn't find anyone during the point in time count. 
Great. And then one, one final thing that I don't know if it was captured, but want to bring it back to the fore before we open to the public. So the county comes to Fairfax, how frequently to connect with unhoused folks in our community? Weekly. Yeah. Weekly. Uh, same uh, uh, outreach teams connect with folks weekly everywhere that they're connected with folks in the county. Um, that frequency can increase if there's a need, you know, with the clients. Um, oftentimes we will get phone calls, um, whether it's from police or fire. Um, it could be from EMS. It could be from you all as elected officials that there's a need or, or something has happened or you've seen something that's concerning. Um, you know, from a client, um, and folks can get out there, you know, additional times as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, I think we should go open the public comment on this presentation item. Um, so we'll do that for folks here in the room and then we'll go to folks on zoom. Um, everyone has two minutes to speak and I think the timer, Christine, is it going to be on this, on the screen here? Okay. Excellent. Um, perfect. Well, if anyone wants to um, speak on this item, feel free to uh, come to the podium and a couple folks can line up behind them, but we just want to make sure that we keep that doorway in the back open. Um, I, he I hear the fire folks and PD in my head saying, keep that door open for emergency stuff. So okay. <clears throat> Mark Bell, Fairfax, a couple questions. Um, you didn't mention people who don't want to be in your program do you have an estimate of how many people that could be uh also um when i looked online i guess uh the number from 21 not 2021 to 2022 it increased 83 people to about 1200 i think it is i don't know what the current numbers are uh and then the other thing uh, would be, I'm sure that uh, I, I looked at the armory to see what was happening with that. That says closed. Uh, I'm sure there are commercial spaces that are vacant. And I don't understand why that can't be a resource, especially like, for example, in an armory, if people had, uh, you know, a secure space within, the, within there, uh, you would have plumbing. You could run Wi-Fi into there so that people could connect uh, to the possibility of um, finding a job or getting help. And I don't hear any of that being mentioned as uh, possibilities or potential uh, ways to go about this. So uh, those are my questions. Thank you, Mark. And we'll just keep taking questions and then we'll be able to check in with Gary at the end. Please. Yes, uh, Michael Bauernfeind. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the authority of the local police to regulate and safeguard these encampments, like the ones we have here in Fairfax? Thank you, Michael. I, I presume it would be for the uh, policeman here, but yeah, we'll, it's a we'll general question. Yeah. We'll address the these questions at the end of the public comment period, just so there's not back and forth. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tyler Snow, resident of Fairfax for 40 years. Um, my experience in bartending for the last 20 years has put me in contact with a wide cross-section of the homeless, mentally ill, and addicted population, um, offering them services to get the ones who want housed housed is definitely top priority and good job. My question is, I've come in contact with a lot of mentally ill and hopelessly addicted individuals who don't necessarily want a place to live or they're too mentally ill to maintain housing. Um, that element I see coming. Um, as you might know, I do bubbles on the corner a lot and I'm seeing more and more drug deals, hard drugs, clever drug dealers coming in doing their thing in the parkade and taking off. Um, what are we doing about that? The, the, the people that do slip through the cracks. Um, are we just going to let them stay in the park? Thank you, Tyler. 
Next speaker, please. Uh, George Taylor, resident of Fairfax. Uh, I think the purpose of this kind of gathering is to figure out how to serve the population of homeless that's in Fairfax. So I really appreciate the council's uh, direction for that. Um, about 15 years ago, the town council through the volunteer board helped create the Fairfax food pantry. And in that 15 years, we've served approximately 150,000 families, uh, uh, 175 a week times 15 years. A good percentage of that population, say five to 10 percent, is homeless. So the Fairfax Town Council is already supporting the town council, uh, the homeless population in Fairfax. And Chance reminded me, since we both volunteered out there, that a good proportion of the people that are coming to volunteer at the food pantry are homeless. So they are contributing members of our community. And a lot of the people that come to receive food at the food pantry are homeless in their cars or they are working homeless. So there's a, a diverse population here. It's not all the mentally ill. And uh, my hope here is that there's some way of organizing more resources for the homeless population that we see in Fairfax. That would be a good outcome of this meeting, I think. What can we actually do for the people that are here in Fairfax? So having had some experience delivering food to homeless people, I wanna suggest some possibilities in my in my 36 seconds um that that taking them water food making sure that they have sanitation showers um bathrooms is all ways of of supporting other humans that live in our community and i i think with a small uh, redirecting of resources some of those basic needs of people would be supplied and i really appreciate what this gentleman said earlier a lot of these people don't want homes right they don't want homes, but they do need food and water and I think and sanitation and bathrooms. And I would like the town to look into providing those kind of services. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, anyone else who wants to speak on this item? Good evening, Todd Greenberg here. I live downtown in uh, Fairfax on Bolinas Road. And uh, I appreciate humanitarian efforts. I'm here tonight wearing black because I'm mourning because somebody just died. They just OD'd. They OD'd on fentanyl. I'm wearing blue in support of the police and the fire department who are trying to do their best. But as I understand it, their wings have been clipped by this town council's policies and directions. I'm really disappointed. And I think there's some families that are really, really sad about what's being allowed to happen here in Fairfax. And I understand you're trying to handle this in a polite way. And I understand there's government and there's bureaucracies. But I want to commend, actually, uh, Mayor Catrano for recognizing and asking a question about scale, because that's the first time that I've heard that in a number of years here in Fairfax. This is a small community, and what you've proposed is a long-term treatment modality for those that wish to engage I know somebody very involved in San Francisco, and I know people who've been very involved in San Rafael with homeless. A lot of these people do not want to engage, and they want to be involved with drugs, and they are harming our community, and we need to find a way, and this town council needs to find a way not to just move it along and participate in bureaucracy, but immediately with some kind of urgency ordinance that you could do tonight no one else should die i don't have the ordinance ready for you but i'm going to ask that you come up with one and prevent further deaths thank you thank you todd next speaker please uh, you're perfect uh, normally i don't engage in reactionary politics but uh in this case, I would like to say that there is a slight small disparagence uh, between uh, those that, because most of the people in Fairfax sort of know each other and cross paths at one time or another. And it seems that 
that uh, most of the people that are in the house that we come across with are usually from somewhere else. And they've usually arrived on the bus, gotten out, and they just stayed. And so we're sort of, in a way, the kind of strange, so we're left kind of like to to pick up the pieces, whatever going on in, in that person's life. Um, the majority of the people that I've come across, with, in my experience, are incommunicable. I can't communicate with them. It's nearly impossible. Um, so, so there's this sort of disparity between people, uh, disparity between people who are uh, in Fairfax that have fallen on hard times and become unhoused, versus people who are just showing up. And so and that's why I say it's a little bit reactionary of me. But I, I just noticed that there's this kind of thing happening, and we're just sort of left, sort of like to, I don't know, in in, in short of it, to try to subsidize the problem. It just you know as it appears before us so it's it's kind of tricky because uh on one hand we want to do we want to handle it uh with some kid gloves but then there is some sort of social harm that's going across i do want to say that i lived in Leipzig in germany i can tell you that that there yes it's there are people standing in front of the stores all day drinking and and there's major anti-social behavior there but the the unhoused situation is not particularly the same. I don't see the degree, for example, of the mental health degree that you see here. Uh, there, yes, there are some serious antisocial uh, behavior, but the the degree at which the mental health here is is it's much greater. I never saw anybody come into town and defecate on the on the uh, 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 city benches, or I never saw anybody come into a shop sh uh, shopping center and try to beat people up or, or something like that. I, I rarely, rarely ever saw something like that. Whereas here I do actually see it. So there, there is a little bit of a difference in, in the qualitativeness of the mental health. So that's all I just wanted to put that there. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Michael McIntosh. Thank you, town council. With all the funding coming through for the different programs, I hope there's going to be some allocation of those funds to our fire and police. Because no matter how we need the help, whether it's a fire or a fight or a medical tragedy, the first people we call are the fire and the police. And they're out there. They're also the most vulnerable because they, they're exposed to civil recourse and different things. I don't think the council has been very supportive of the people that help us. And I think that maybe with this discussion, it'll give you an opportunity to look at the benefit of having our police and fire and think about how we can allocate funds to them, protect them from civil recourse, and provide them maybe with additional assistance since they're our front line. They go out there before any of us get out of our house. They go out there to settle the fight before we go and expose ourselves. So I think we really owe them a great thanks and I think with all the funds coming through, with even the $20 billion bond for affordable housing, we should allocate funds to the service that's actually there on the ground, helping everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Jeannie Shaw, Fairfax resident. Would you move your the mic closer to your mouth? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for the information tonight. Gary, I just have two questions. One, most of the numbers were about uh, countywide, all the numbers you were giving out tonight. Do we have a number for um, how many homeless are actually in Fairfax as opposed to countywide? And then the second thing is, where are the encampments in Fairfax located right now? I only know about one that's up on the baseball field, but are there other ones? And if so, where are they? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, any other speakers on this? And okay, great. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Tony Gardner. I'm a resident of Fairfax, and um, thank you, Gary, for the excellent presentation. Um, I just want to encourage you to really oops, thank you, Mark. Um, I want to enc encourage you guys to um, really you know, take into consideration everything that Gary has said about a continuum of care approach, because um, that's the, if we actually do want to address homelessness, then we're going to have to um, continue to increase housing and supportive services. 
And I, I would also like to touch on what some of the other people have mentioned too. Those have to be integrated with mental health services and substance abuse treatment services as well. The police, you know, fire, they have, you know, an important role to play, but we can't expect them to be social workers. So, um, you know, coordination between police, mental health, substance abuse, behavioral health, physical health are all um, strategies that will help to resolve homelessness, not just in Fairfax, but um, throughout Marin, throughout the state, wherever it is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Otherwise, we'll go to Zoom. Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll go to Zoom then. Yes, I see several hands raised on Zoom. The first speaker is Ava. And Ava, you're unmuted now. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Thanks. I'm on my bike commute, so I apologize for the freeway noise. Uh, yeah, a couple points. Um, I wanted to um, point out some counterfactuals that you heard both from the presenter and from members of the audience. Uh, right away, um, the claim that uh, the police and fire are the most vulnerable. Um, actually, the police are the, one of the least vulnerable members of the community. It's If you check uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, it doesn't even make the top 10 of most dangerous jobs in the country. Uh, let's see. The other thing, I say this as someone who worked at UCSF uh, emergency department, helping to care for unhoused people. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, for people to keep in mind that the longer you are unhoused, uh, the more likely you are going to exhibit uh, signs of mental illness. Uh, that has a lot to do with sleep deprivation and often patients who are sleep de deprived may uh, exhibit symptoms of psychosis. It's called sleep deprivation induced psychosis. Uh, for the speaker who talked about his time in Germany, uh, the reason you don't see this sort of thing in Germany is because Germany has much more public housing. And if you're unclear on that, you can talk to the fellows at uh, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, they're, they're pretty good on that topic. Um, I do want to point out uh, also that if you're concerned about uh, fentanyl, you might want to take a look at the San Jose Police Department. Their um, executive director of their union uh, was charged. She was indicted for trafficking fentanyl for eight years. White lady, uh, nice blonde grandmother, uh, Joanne Segovia. Uh, while we're on that topic, $3.28 billion for the Drug Enforcement Administration, and uh, every year, more drugs. Thank you, Ava. That's Thank your time. You. The next speaker is Mike, and you're unmuted now. Yeah, hello. I agree with everything Ava just said, and uh, I think the biggest problem um, is that we get all this funding from government, federal government, state government, local government to provide housing. <clears throat> and most of it goes to a system that provides housing and not actually provide, providing housing. So you end up hiring all these caseworkers that nobody wants to deal with. Most of these people that live in these encampments don't want to have to go deal with this person, that person, you know, the doctors, the this, the that, to get a house, to get a place to live. But for some reason, um, they put all these stipulations on how they can get into housing and to do it, you got to jump through so many hoops that a perfectly sane, sound person without a drug problem or anything would have a hard time getting through all this crap. <clears throat> um, that's all. I just, it's a joke. And also homeless people are the most vulnerable pe people, uh, especially when it comes to police violence. And when police constantly mistake um, uh, mentally, <clears throat> unhealthy person, you know, for being under the influence of drugs without giving them any testing. And the police that are sitting in that room right now are guilty of this crime, falsely charging people of, of crimes, throwing them in jail, taking away their liberties. Um, you know, you all ought to start looking at how you view people that are unhoused instead of <clears throat> making your judgments. That's all. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Philip, and Philip, you're unmuted now. Hi there, can you hear me? We sure can. 
Great. Uh, Ms. Blash recently ventured on the next door concerning the homeless problem in town. While I'm sure citizens appreciate the information she provided, it's missing a very important component, leadership. On next door, Ms. Blash offered no solutions and offered no opinion about what she finds acceptable behavior as it relates to the campers. Mr. Mayor, when we spoke at the farmer's market, I suggested a video camera at the camp that could be monitored from the police station so that if laws were being broken, like people doing drugs, or a dangerous situation came up, like an arson fire, officers could immediately take appropriate action. These things have already happened and more. Luckily, no one has been hurt yet. Mr. Mayor, you said all I want to do is lock up the homeless, and that's not true. Arresting campers for camping is illegal and is not a solution to the homeless problem, and I don't support that. I do support evenly enforcing the laws that are on the books. Mr. Mayor, if you can't defecate in the park, or if Ms. Hellman cannot do drugs in the park, or Ms. Kohler can't get drunk in the park, or Mr. Ackerman and Ms. Blash can't have a fire in the park, then I hope you agree that the campers should not be able to do these things either. The council cannot solve the homeless problem. I know that. But each of you can tell the citizens what helpful solutions you uh, have, what helpful real world, uh, real world solutions you have. To simply give boilerplate information about homelessness and tell people your hands are tied is not leadership and it's not good enough. At a minimum, tell us what you think is acceptable and unacceptable behavior at the camp. Two simple questions for you all on the dais tonight. One, should laws be uniformly enforced in Fairfax? And two, do any of you support a video camera? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, the next speaker, sorry, is Chris P. And Chris, you're unmuted now. Hello, Town Council. Uh, hey, Gary, thanks for that presentation. Um, I want to start my comment by addressing some of the gross sentiments people have expressed towards our homeless neighbors. Uh, you can focus on, on, I mean, you focus on how some of these individuals don't want housing, but how can you expect them to trust any one of us when we have members of the community denigrating them as, you know, akin to the untouchables of the Indian caste system? You can go in next door, like right now, and see people talking about forming citizen defense groups to quote, unquote, deal with the problem themselves. We don't live in a society that prioritizes care and I can't fault someone who has been abandoned by that system to like suddenly have faith in it. I mean, if anyone was listening to this meeting tonight, like, come on, it's, it's gross. And second, I have a question actually for either Gary or the town council. How do you think the recently passed just cause and rent stabilization ordinances can benefit our community by preventing people from falling into homelessness? Somewhere in the presentation, I believe there was a comment that elderly people make up a large portion of the homeless population, and I just can't help but make the connection to just cause of rent stabilization being the necessary stop gaps that will prevent even more people from becoming homeless. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Chelsea. You're unmuted now, Chelsea. Chelsea? Oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? We can. Hi, sorry, Um, my nine-year-old son, Gus, would like to ask a quick question. Hi, Um, my question is, why don't we have a homeless center for just like Fairfax and San Rafael? Because I don't think that there'd be like, enough plate um like beds in the shelter that we have right now thank you thank you both very much thank you the next speaker is pj pfeffer you're unmuted now pj hey, thank you <laughs> excuse me um yeah, I'd like to um, echo and uh, express my appreciation for the comments made by um, Eva, Mike, and Chris P. I, too, find it extremely uh, depressing, uh, the demoralizing, the humanizing, you know, really eliminationist rhetoric directed um, too often at our homeless neighbors. 
there seems to be um, echoed in a lot of these comments, a very we versus them uh, frame of reference as if uh, anybody living in our community who's unhoused is not a member of our community, which they are. Um, you know, I know some folks have said that they don't necessarily think that you should just be arrested or put in jail for being homeless. Um, but, you know, uh, selective enforcement of petty crime to jail people is really just that. Um, and, you know, it, we're, that's right. We, you know, we don't have uh, even universal enforcement of the laws. Vulnerable populations, uh, minority groups, uh, less wealthy groups are disproportionately targeted in the ones subject to uh, enforcement for things like uh, drinking in public, doing drugs in public, public urination, all of which I'm sure many of the wealthy Marin County residents do all the time with impunity. Uh, you know, it, part of the problem with addressing this is the lack of public money. And every time that uh, we decide to arrest people and put them in jail and move them from the encampments they've set up for their own protection, we are spending more money on those correctional resources uh, than would be spent to just house them. Some of that money needs to be redirected from carceral solutions to just direct to cash transfers and housing people. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker. The next speaker is Kay. You're unmuted now. Hi, everyone. Um, I was a nurse at San Quentin. I actually opened up the EOP, the Enhanced Outpatient Yard. I've dealt with the most marginalized people. Um, and what we have is human beings. Everyone who spoke tonight has been correct. What we have is human beings in crisis. And we're not going to solve it tonight. But for me, the hard line, it just for tonight, it's about the fires. And we need not to have open flames happening in Perry Park. That is what has to start now, because that is a risk to the health and safety of our whole community, including the unhoused, because it's their home too. So um, we need to divert money. And our police department, is the most is more diverse in our community and they've already shown they can handle this situation with compassion and care so we do need to divert some money to them to observe this we can't ignore these people in crisis and um we need to help and we need to take care of ourselves uh also on a side note it, you're total hypocrites for even considering taking wall property for open space. We need more open space, like we need a hole in the head. We need housing and you need to take the money, the 45,000 or whatever you would put for rent stabilization, put that into this situation, wait till we vote on it. Oh, real quick and go back to, just, just, just for the time being, go back to the community mediation program for the appeals that we had. I made it. 14 seconds to go. Thank you, Kay. The next, <clears throat> sorry, the next speaker is Jason, and you're unmuted now, Jason. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, great. Hey, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, thank you, Gary, for the presentation and for the questions from the town council. And uh you know, I started that homeless camp in Novato, and I want to let a lot of people know that, you know, case we we have case managers there, and it's been very successful. In a little over a year, we've had 18 people being housed. It does take time. It does take trust, but it, it can happen. Now, as far as Fairfax is concerned, I mean, I don't know if you have enough of a population to warrant a camp. I mean, it's such small compared to other cities that are grappling with homelessness. But if you did, it would be it would it be cool um, if you had an area. But if not, you know the the what two or three four campers that are at uh, Perry Park. You know, I just want to let people know there's there's ways to mitigate fire. 
there's uh, ways to mitigate, you know, people wanting to stay warm. Um, you know, we have, we have a deal at our camp, you know, no open flame. We use a gas barbecue. You know, if you had an area set up for where people could do safe cooking with a gas barbecue, you know, I, I have the means to donate a barbecue. Um, you know, a, a porta potty would help. You know, it's very daunting for people that are homeless to to use the bathroom at the police station. Um, there's resources I'm sure we could find for for helping. You know, with a porta potty, but that would that would take those arguments of fire risk and and people using the bathroom at the park in the park. That would take that argument right out of the equation. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to get the community involved for, for like a, a, a blanket drive. We could donate a patio heater. There's all sorts Thanks. of ways to mitigate. Thank you, Jason. That's your comment. Thank mm -hmm. you. There are no more raised hands. Okay. We are going to close public comment on this item and take it back to the dais. Does anyone have any follow-up for... Gary or staff? Yes, Vice Mayor. I just have one, Gary. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot is why can't you know you just move people? And I think you might want to speak to the Martin v. Boise case, which I mean, there are lots of reasons not to move people that have nothing to do with a law a legal case, but maybe you can just speak to that briefly so people have an understanding of what that does, or is that something that you can speak to? Uh, I I can speak to it within my knowledge and experience, but I'm not an attorney. <laughs> uh, but my understanding of Martin v. Boise um, from the case in Idaho was that um, municipalities couldn't prohibit individuals from sitting, lying, sleeping um, in the community when no alternative was available. That, that was really the fundamental of the case. There, there were some, there's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of nuance to some of the follow-up cases and the decisions that have happened through the different circuit courts. Um, an additional community, uh, an additional decision had said that you know, communities can't prohibit um, homeless individuals from having possessions. Um, some communities have tried to clear away, you know, all possessions that an individual has, and there were some challenges to that. Um, there are nuances to all of it because, you know, it really depends on circumstances, you know, the situation, what the, you know, what the possessions are, like, you know, things like that. But um, so, you know, I think, through your city attorney or, or other folks, you know, to get more detailed information on that. But I think what's important to understand from just the humanistic perspective of forcing people to move all the time is that one, it creates trauma, you know, for the individual. Um, second, a very pragmatic um, thing that can happen is that the person is lost to the connections that they have from outreach workers or case managers. If you can't find someone, you can't continue to help them. Um, not knowing where they are on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, makes that a lot more challenging. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Gary and I have a question for the chief. Um, Gary, is there anything else we could be doing? I'd love to hear just your thoughts on that. At one point, and I would love our council to reconsider, I suggested we have a subcommittee looking at this and involve the community on this um, because the MCCMC one is very focused on Nevada, San Rafael and the, the bigger you know, solutions for the larger encampments, San, uh, Sausalito as well. So I'd really like a focused community effort on on addressing, you know, really coming up with recommendations and solutions, but I'd love to hear um, what, if anything, you think we else we could be doing. And my question for the chief is, do you feel like you have the support you need from this council to do your job? I understood you and the, your department's job. I understood that the PD was visiting the Perry Park encampment twice a day on the foot beat or the beat on the beat. <laughs> is that, is that correct? 
Uh, so in terms of suggestions, you know, every community is different. And I think solutions need to really be localized to the experience that communities are having. And I think having a group of folks that are regularly talking about it and brainstorming, we're happy to be a part of that with you, you know, on that. We can share what other communities have found to be successful, um, but I think as some of the speakers mentioned, you know, and others, every community is at a different scale, you know, in in what it can do, both in terms of the the issues that it's experiencing and the resources it has to dedicate to those. So I think that. Um, you know, really being able to, you know, have a group that's exploring that on a regular basis, I think could be very proactive in identifying solutions that not only work for a smaller community like Fairfax, but I think as you were just alluding to involve, you know, residents and helping to be part of the solution and contributing in whatever ways they can, whether it's ideas or whether it's, you know, supports like Jason and others were talking about. Thank you. Yeah, I think we do have many, many folks in the community that care deeply and are very creative and would be willing to volunteer their time toward coming up with solutions and help educate the community on somehow the complexity of, of this as well. So thank you. Go ahead, Chief. As Council Member Hellman, uh, we respond to all the calls for service that we receive at the dispatch center, along with providing extra patrol on a daily uh, basis, multiple times for every shift. Uh, I think everyone agrees that Every situation is different. Not not every situation is the same or will have the same answer. It's the expectation of what people believe we should be doing as a police is what varies. And the expectation of uh, success or whether or not we're helping at all in our approach is is what varies or what makes people happy or not happy. But yes, I, I believe the entire community understands that this is dynamic and we all are trying to help out in every way that we can. Uh, we show up to assess uh, mental health, uh, their well-being, or if there's any criminal activity. But the fact that if they're homeless, it's not criminal. And we try to assess every situation independently and try to help in any way we can. But at some point, moving them along, that, that doesn't help anyone because there's nothing we can do about that situation. So homelessness is not a crime. It's that we try to help when we can in our ability to do so without violating any laws, because in both spectrums of this, uh, we're there to support the laws and uphold the laws for every single person there, including the homeless. So it's it's different in every call. It's it's dynamic and we're all here to help. It's just that uh, there's limitations to what we can do for every situation. And do you feel like you have the support of this council? Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, Chief, just another thing. I think when we've talked, you've mentioned where you, you feel that there's mental health issues. You've called in Gary's group as well as the mobile crisis response team. Is that correct? So you're not just going it alone. Yes. Um, the availability of, of resources too is limited. Um, we respond to calls 24 seven uh, response to our request for assistance with mental health issues or housing or any other support is not 24 seven. So there's times we're the only ones that can show up and be there, and we're limited to what we can do as the police. So although everyone supports, it's it's the timing, the availability, and the resources available that limits our approach and what we can do at that time for that person. Thank you. Any other follow-up comments or questions from Councilmember Ackerman or Councilmember Blash? Yeah, I just want to thank the community for making this a really good discussion tonight. Um, and of course, our staff and Gary, um, it's been really civil. And I think people have also really expressed their concerns in a, a really good and thoughtful way, which I appreciate a great deal. Um, I did want to mention that I am, you know, my, I uh, have always had a goal of providing transparency and um, accurate information to the best of my ability to the community. And I feel that that role, there are places where it is best to just provide information and there are other places where you make policy and make decisions. And that place is actually usually in the council chambers um, or in meeting the various committees that the town council is assigned to. And that's where, you know, I hope to exhibit um, a different type of leadership. And um, I think we're starting um, a, an important process tonight, although it's been ongoing in terms of really looking at what's available to us ar around this situation. So I just wanna thank everybody. Thank you very much. Anything, Councilmember Ackerman, before we I give some closing comments? Um, 
I guess I have a, a question for, for Gary, and thank you again for your wealth of information. Uh, when a uh, when an encampment is uh, through one means or another sort of dissolves, is cleared, either through the one of your formal programs to try to close out that encampment or maybe people just drift away, do you, in your experience, do people come back and do other people come back to that, to that place? Is it, I just, I guess what I'm, I'm a little vague on this, but I'm just feeling like some of the concerns I hear might, might revolve around if, if we, as, as a few of our speakers suggested, uh, really help people out, go and put heaters out and make it make it a lot nicer out there so they don't have to make fires does that might that draw more people that's that's my question so i i, I think the answer is a complex one but um what a number of communities have done when they have structured some of their encampments um is to kind of lock in who the population is at that time, you know, when the encampment is structured and, and services are starting. So I think we've seen that from some of our neighboring communities here in Marin, as well as in the Bay Area who say, you know, as of this time, um, this is who's here. And this is our official list of folks who are serving. No new people should be coming in here at this time. Um, similar to what, you know, folks have, that's what folks consistently have been doing around uh, the Bay Area. I think that some of our communities have also seen some of those structured settings be much safer um, and much more um, service rich. Um, and folks who have been in those encampments have been very strongly supportive of each other's. I think one of the speakers was mentioning. And so some cities have thought, you know, again, as we you know, say, here are the 18 people that are in this encampment. This is our census at this time. This is who should be there on any given night. We're going to move these 18 people towards housing. As those numbers have gotten down and people have successfully moved into housing, some of those communities have said, well, this structured place is actually working, you know, kind of well. Should, should we think about, in a structured way, bringing people in? who are then continue to receive those services and continue to be on that pathway to housing. So there have been a variety of approaches really to the, to it. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I, yeah, I just want to thank you all again for, for showing up. Um, I haven't even started giving my comments, so I just please respect that I'm about to speak. Thank you. No, it was, we have a long meeting ahead of us. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I really do appreciate you all um, making it out here um, and giving us a little bit of information from different perspectives. I think um, one of the, the things that Gio brought up with regard to the volunteer board and the Fairfax Food Pantry, I think that was my first um, realization that there are a lot of people that I was seeing around town that I didn't realize were housing insecure or unsheltered that I was friends with or that I knew, but that would show up to, to get food, but also to volunteer and to give back in the same way. Um, so while we might see a couple of um, very visible cases, um, I, there was a question about the point in time count, the most recent point in time count for Fairfax. And I believe the number is, is not um, it doesn't correlate specifically with, you know, people staying close to the pavilion or, or, um, in in the park, um, but there are other folks sleeping in their cars around town. There are folks um, sleeping in, in, in other places. Um, you know, when we did the creek cleanups, there were spots along the creek that we were pulling futons that had been ripped up a couple of years. I mean, before the before COVID. I mean, this is homelessness didn't wasn't created in COVID, right? It's it's an ongoing systemic issue, and it's it's getting worse as um, affordability gets worse. But yeah, I. Can you share, Gary, really quickly? It's it, the number is something like twelve. Is am I, am I right? It's it's in that general ballpark. 
Yeah, um, just to uh, bring together a couple of the comments people made about the point in time count. So um, Marin's point in time count did go up 8% um, in 2022 since the last cycle, um, right before that, um, to a total of 1,121 individuals. We feel that that number could have, that increase was pretty small um, in comparison to what it could have been um, had Marin had not had strong programs um, like our homeless system continuing to house folks like emergency rental assistance um, throughout the pandemic. And the specific number for Fairfax at that time was 13. 13. Okay, great. Thank you. That's super helpful. Um, and also, I, I spoke on it briefly earlier, and I know we need to keep these sorts of things at, at high levels just to respect the privacy of folks that are in these processes. But um, last year, there were people that had reached out to us. We had we agendized a meeting. We had mixed stop. We had Ashley, um, your colleague, uh, give a you know an update in August, and the the very people that um, people had questions about at that time have one way or another um been housed and and i you know that shows up on the website you all update which you didn't really speak on uh yet but could you speak a little bit to the the efficacy that we've seen even in the last year of trying to find you know the their myriad pathways or tools that you all use but or that we collaborate around but can you speak to that a little bit sure i think that you know when we see any encampment, you know, in the community or just visible homelessness at all, it's tempting to think that the people we see are the same people all the time. Um, and sometimes, you know, it can, you know, as I was saying earlier in my comments, it, it can be agonizingly slow, you know, to move towards that pathway um, and that permanent housing destination. But oftentimes, um, you know, given our numbers, we're very successful <laughs> at getting folks housed. And sometimes who you see now aren't the same people that you saw before um, in similar locations. And so we do have a dashboard uh, that where we keep track of those overall numbers. So when I was talking about the number of chronically homeless folks, the number of veterans, the number of families, the number of people still remaining in our system, that's on our data, our data dashboard. Um, at, that folks can find on Marin HHS website. It's housingfirst.marinhhs.org. Um, and then you can just go to the data tab. What we've done uh, in the past couple of years is work with municipalities to report on the numbers um, of folks in encampments as well and where folks are at in their housing pathway there, how many folks have been housed, how many folks are currently on a housing pathway. Um, sometimes with smaller encampments, we need to anonymize that information a little bit so that it's not so immediately identifiable, um, but we do keep track of it there and it's a good place for folks to get a broad perspective of what the status of encampments are across the county, including in Fairfax. Great, thank you. And um, I believe there was also a comment and this has come up kind of time and time again, but but not just in Fairfax, but you know, as a bigger question around, uh, commercial real estate or office space, or, you know, we, we see vacant office space all over the place and people start thinking, well, what about redevelopment of that? Or, you know, yeah, just trying to be creative. And I know that there are some challenges, just sometimes there are office spaces where there, there's a lot of offices inside with no windows or, you know, not a lot of natural light or things like that. But, um, you know, there are other people that are trying to figure out what that might look like. Can you speak a little bit to that um, to address some of those comments? Sure. Um, and actually, one of the county's home key projects under round one, the 3301 Kerner project um, in the canal, um, is actually an old office building that's being converted to uh, housing. It will be um, that housing specifically will be dedicated to folks who have behavioral health issues um, and need intensive services. So it'll be one of our more intensive sites. Uh, 26 folks who will be living there. Um, will be relocated from the existing Carmel program. Um, and there'll be 14 new spaces there available for individuals who are currently homeless, who have some type of serious mental illness. Um, we want, and the state has been moving in the direction as well of, you know, asking counties and communities to provide more intensive housing supports for individuals who are experiencing um, serious mental illness on the street, you know, it is 
that is a challenge, you know, from care courts to investments in housing to, um, you know, mandating that the that our systems of homelessness and behavioral health serve these clients um, and get them into a safe permanent housing destination um, has been a priority of the state that has been coming down very strongly. Um, one of the, you know, this is an area where, you know, there can be some unique opportunities and traction for municipalities as they look at their housing elements or other things, an opportunity for folks who own some of these spaces to become part of the solution, um, as happened in San Rafael. Um, with that process, San Rafael was able to support some of that work at 3301 Kerner through their housing trust, um, which was fantastic. Um, the Practically, I'll just leave on this comment, practically sometimes transitioning office space to housing can be difficult, um, mostly because the infrastructure in buildings that are meant for offices is not often easily transferable to housing. So sometimes you might have an office building that has like two bathrooms per floor when you really need that to be 20 bathrooms per floor for it to be housing. Um, and sometimes these buildings aren't set up with the proper water, sewage, you know, infrastructure to sustain the way you would build housing. You know, they're, they're built on a different scale, you know, to support offices. It's not impossible. Um, sometimes it can be doable, you know, like we're seeing the transformation in that building in San Rafael. Sometimes it can be extraordinarily expensive. It really depends on the building. Got it. Thank you. Um, I had three kind of quick fire things for the whole team at the table here, because I'd be remiss not to, um, you know, leverage these resources, especially since we're hearing very nuanced or very specific things from the community. But um, Gary, so in the event um, that someone is having like some sort of mental episode or something, and there's someone experiencing homelessness, um, from your perspective, professionally, you'd recommend them connecting with, uh, like someone calling, um, the mobile crisis or, or 911, and then they can connect with mobile crisis to provide services to those folks. Um, but for other things, if they're just showing up in a new part of town that you hadn't seen them before, they should be calling that, um, 413 home. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, Chief Tabaranza, quick question for you. Um, folks, you know, we, we hear about drugs, drug dealing issues. I'd love to be able to divorce the, somebody being unsheltered and an issue with drugs. Like it's those two things aren't necessarily like, you know, going together all the time. Um, even though it can be conflated, but, um, in the event that somebody in the parkade is, uh, you know, believed to be doing a drug deal or something like that. Doesn't have to be an unsheltered person, but just anybody. Best thing is just to call 911. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Um, and then finally, um, Chief Mahoney, um, and we have our fire inspector here as well. Uh, how do you, how do you pronounce your last name? Bastian? Bastianon. Bastianon. Bastion on. Okay. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> I just, it's easier for me to say Rob, but in these circumstances, I'm trying to use last names, but, um, we, uh, here, and of course we had Jason, um, who's on the human rights, human rights commission in Fermarin County, um, you know, talking about different approaches to addressing concerns related to ways that people are cooking food, um, or ways that people are keep, keeping themselves warm or look, having not like a light at nighttime or something like that. Um, you all, to my knowledge, have checked out some of these things in the past. Um, if they're, if the community raises concerns about these things, doesn't have to be in any particular area, but just generally you all respond, you're the folks who would respond to concerns about open flame or something like that. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and is there a sort of best practice, like to the point that Jason was mentioning, like people might be making suggestions or we might end up moving forward with some sort of community committee that puts forward suggestions, um, but like cook stove, that sort of thing. How, how does the fire department perceive those sort, sorts of things just to um, 
get a sense of it? Like, is it all depending on where it exactly is or how does that generally work? So currently the town, the, the park does have cooking facilities where they do allow barbecues and warm in cooking fires. It's, it's already permitted within the parks. I don't know how you would manage that in specific areas other than possibly adding more cooking facilities. Got it. Okay. Um, and if there are, um, in the event that there are for anyone, whether it's a sheltered person or an unsheltered person with some sort of open flame in our park facilities or in, in town, and you all end up getting the call or PD gets the call and, and, you know, passes it along to you all. Um, how, what does that look like? You, if, if it's unsafe or if it's dangerous, you ask folks to put it out and then, you know, give them recommendation or, or yeah. What does that look like just to, you know, we hear about these things one step removed, but it's kind of good to know how it actually plays out too. Yeah. So usually the fire crews will get on scene they'll deem it unsafe and they'll extinguish the fire and help educate, um, whoever the individual is, who's, who has a, who has a fire, um, to, you know, that it is unsafe and to prevent it for, from further happening. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. I, we, we hear those questions a lot about e each of those things um, and just wanted to get a sense from a high level. I think that addressed a lot of the questions that have been on my mind. Um, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about this because this is, a, I think Kay mentioned, like we're not solving the issue tonight, the issue. We didn't create the issue necessarily. Um, we're all part of the, yeah, bearing the brunt of it. But uh, just again, want to thank Gary, you so much for coming out and chiefs and um, fire inspector Bastian, Bastian, Bastian on, Bastian on, Bastian on, got it. I know. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I, yeah, thank you so much again. And yeah. One more thing. Yeah. I could just add something, Mr. Mayor. Yes, please. Uh, What's important to understand here is that we work great together. So if you're not sure if it's a safe fire or if there's criminal activity or if there's concern for someone's well-being, just call our department. Uh, we respond within seconds or minutes. We respond quickly and we're able to assess the situation and get the resources we need. The situation we had with the arson or the fire here, uh, we quickly mobilized with the fire department, the inspector, and also Gary with those people that were displaced from the area. So we're able to assess whether or not it's a mental health issue, if it's a criminal matter, if it's a fire matter, or if there's a need for resources from the county. So just call. And what's frustrating is when we hear it about these crimes or things that's happening in places, but no one reported it. So call, you know, because if you're seeing drug deals in the parkade, I didn't get a call from you. So let us know so we can assess it or at least figure out who these people are that are involved and know that we're hearing about it, we're addressing it, and we can do something about it instead of stacking it up and making complaints about it after the fact when we can't do anything. Thank you. Got it. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Well said. And so appreciative to have you all here and knowing that you're all in coordination as we're confronting this. So thank you again. Yeah, please. Um, Gary, just um, it's my understanding that the mobile crisis response team is now 24 seven. It used to be just a few hours a day. And at least reading the newspaper, it's supposed to be 24 seven. I realize there's not unlimited resources, but can you respond to that? Um, at least I read the newspaper that it was supposed to be 24 seven. Yeah, I, I would, I, I want to get accurate information from our behavioral health and recovery support division on that. I know the, the state has required that we move towards a 24 seven, seven day a week uh, approach. Um, but I don't want to misspeak of whether we're there yet or not. So let me follow up with you on that. Okay. So and that you can disseminate that info. It would be good for the chief because they do rely on them. And in the past, the hours were so limited and there were so few people that they often couldn't respond at all. So that'd be great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, this was a presentation item. I think later in the meeting, we can have a conversation at the end about how we would agendize something moving forward specific to this. Um, but with that, I think that concludes this part of the, the meeting, the presentation, the special meeting. So the, yeah, thank you all again. And you're all 
welcome to hang out as long as you'd like. There are a lot of exciting items or you're welcome to take leave too. And next, we'll take a five minute break. Next item, we'll actually be talking about some innovative ways to get housing built. So yeah, yeah. Thank you all again. We are now moving on. Now that we finished the special meeting presentation, we are moving back to our regular meeting programming. Um, and we are at the time open time for public expression, which is up to 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll do the rest at the end of the agenda if there's more open time. Um, this is time to address the council on matters not on the agenda. All comments are limited to two minutes. The council is not permitted to take action and state law strictly limits the right of the council to discuss any unagendized item unless it can be demonstrated to be of an, an emergency nature or the need to take an immediate action arose after the posting of the agenda. Um, and we'll do 15 minutes in the room and then we'll do 15 minutes on Zoom and then we'll move any others to the end of the agenda so we can address the business items that were scheduled for the meeting. So with that, we will start open time. Thank you, Mayor, Michael McIntosh. Um, first thing pertained to the last presentation, my old office was 3301 Kerner Boulevard. The project was slated for $23.45 million when they started that, and I'm sure they ran over budget. That's still $570,000 per unit. If the average nice little mini home is $26,000, you could buy 20 mini homes and throw them away and put them in small little places for the cost for each room. And that's before the social services. So something to think about. What I want to actually say this evening, I really think it's poor governance by this town council for not having the housing element front and center on each meeting. I thought that the last time you put on the consent calendar was disingenuous. The report that you provide by staff and you gave this rosy appearance, bad form. That letter criticized you guys. It was also not readily available to the public. I had to dig it out to get it. There was also a meeting which probably came about because I called for it from HCD. And when I learned about this, me and I came down, I went to the office and spoke to Susan and I couldn't be included. It's a public expense. So then when I saw our new planner leave the building, I said, hey, introduce myself. I said, I'd like to be a part of this meeting. He said, it's not my meeting to invite you. Again, bad form. You'd certainly get a lot more support from your community if you would actually invite us in there so we can work with you. If any of you guys up here read that letter from HCD, it even quoted my name on providing them information because you guys are so far out in left field. I would really appreciate if you'd agendize this every single month until you do your job. This is going to be the biggest expense for our town. It's going to change our town more than anything else. And the future expenses of when you put this housing in and then have to do all the utility improvements and such, I figure will bond out at over $180 million amortized over 30 years for the 3,100 parcels in Fairfax. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Next speaker, please. Mark Bell. So with the two hour special meeting, uh, the two minute limit for the meeting itself uh, is fine. However, going to the consent calendar is still a violation of adjudicated California law by a appeals court. Therefore, you're in violation because you took an oath because the law, after it's adjudicated, is constitutionally sound, you're in violation of the Brown Act and violating our civil rights. Secondly, when you say that you're going to have the questions that are asked answered at the end, all the questions were not answered. This is totally untruthful and unacceptable. I have a friend who wrote a book on the history of Marin County. 
there were a lot of great buildings that all burned down. He said after like the eighth one or tenth one, he had to take out a Roger Thesaurus to try to find other ways to say this uh, building had burned down because it was just getting too repetitive. The, the pavilion almost joined it. You can have your firewise meetings and all this other stuff, but it doesn't matter if you're allowing people to do, to camp where they are with open flame. There was a recommendation to move them to the uh, west end uh, parking lot at the library, which would be a much safer locale. And that would be a space that's available and that would be legal to have people move there if they come here or if they want to camp here. And the other thing, just one note, I don't know if uh, Council Member Blash listens to what she said, but at the last meeting, uh, she basically said uh, she doesn't care about 200,000 people in the Democratic Republic of Congo mining cobalt and flip-flops and tank tops because people in Arizona were hot. Thanks, well, Mark. it's much hotter in Ahwaz, Iran, much hotter in Senegal, much hotter in the Sudan, and these people have survived without air conditioning for millennia. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, please. Uh, good evening. Um, well, happy Halloween almost. Um, it's that time of the year when our children and families look forward to Fairfax tradition of trick-or-treating on Dominga and Napa on Halloween night. These two streets, Dominga and Napa, are close to the traffic, allowing families to socialize and children to trick-or-treat. However, <clears throat> this can be quite expensive for the families who are distributing the candy. Pre-COVID, the town would collect the candy from thoughtful individuals to help offset these costs. A volunteer would then just collect the candy and disperse them to the households. Um, I would like to propose that start again. And if you would like to help out and to continue with this wonderful Fairfax tradition, I would suggest you please bring your candy, wrapped candy, of course, this thing doesn't stay out, in a bag, like a Costco bag, um, to the town hall at 142 Bolinas Road. The town will be looking for a volunteer. I have been looking and I will continue to look for someone who could deliver the candy to these households um, and distribute it to the neighbors. And that's about it. So I'm hoping we could keep this tradition alive. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Next speaker, please. Karen, I just want to uh, thank you all for all that you do and all the people who were here. And I learned from Janet that this is not a place where people can actually ask questions and get answers. But I also learned that from you, Mayor, that you told people here, again, and I'm seconding Mark. Mark's comment, that I, this is my first meeting here. I, I just come to work uh, to babysit my grandchildren, but my kids couldn't be here. Um, but I'm here often, and I see kids around the parks and all of that. So my point being about the answers to questions, you told people here, your questions will all be answered at the end. But instead of answering their questions or letting the people and the, the, the wonderful gentleman with the presentation had taken wonderful notes. I thought he was going to be able to share those notes. But instead, you decided to interpret what everyone had asked and what people had said, even saying people were uh, combining uh, homeless with druggies. And that's not what people are saying. So I think it's offensive to um, have done that to the community and to these people who had these honest questions. Um, and I would have really liked to have heard it from the source instead of our questions being interpreted by you and reworded. And then uh, also, um, I think a lot of people's minds is the comments, which I honestly, I'm ignorant about, but about Doc Edgar Park. That would have been something good to address tonight because that's a big concern, whether it's false or whether they're 
there are other answers to the question. That would have been a very, very important, pertinent question to answer to get the, the facts out correctly. Thank you. I'm not crying. I just lost my slide. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Next speaker. Good, good evening. Frank Ager here from the Cascades. As we see crime see, creeping into the into Marin County, um, you know, it's expanding from the cities, from the major cities into the rural areas too. Uh, many governmental agencies are now instituting uh, license plate readers on their on their police vehicles, uh, license plate readers at some entries to, to, to their towns, and cameras. Um, perhaps it's time for Fairfax to have that discussion about about whether or not Fairfax needs to institute license plate readers and and cameras for neighborhoods. I know there's some neighborhoods are buying their own cameras now, but um, because of of the increase in 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 car bunkers and other things, uh, I I'm just recommending that we have a, a community discussion about discussion about license plate readers and cameras. Thank you. Thank you. It's, there's anyone else in the room? This would be the time. If not, we'll then go to Zoom. Wow, there's so much to speak on. <laughs> this is Todd. Uh, you all know me. So I don't think I adequately addressed the arson that just happened and how the pavilion just almost burned down despite my having noticed all of you for over a year about the fire hazard. And I had spoken previously with Ross Valley Fire Department and they said, wow, you know, there's only so much we can do. Your council, it's really up to them. Now, I suppose you could look at me and you could go, yeah, he's just crying wolf. But guess what? It's a real threat that doesn't belong here in Fairfax. And I'm not talking chance about singling out any particular class of people. I'm talking about a fire hazard to the whole town, to everybody, a matter of public safety. I don't know what Janet can come up with. I don't know what you can come up with, but I know you're involved with a lot of people. And I think the number one thing that you should be concentrating on when I'm talking about an urgency ordinance, which Cal Cities has articles on, and I know some of you are attending their seminars. So you could find out how to do an urgency ordinance. You could make changes as you frequently do and change your ordinances or start enforcing the fire issues before this town burns down. This needs to be taken care of this week, not just an arrest for somebody who violated the law. And luckily we didn't burn down, but you need to make sure this town doesn't burn down. And I know I think all of you want to do it and maybe you don't know how to do it, but please, we want to help. Don't let this town burn down. Next, consent calendar. Um, uh, there's a problem here. You're not doing it right. Todd, would you be able to share the consent calendar item, your comments on that when we get to the consent calendar? Because you're at time now, but I, I do want to hear the comment, but it, that might be the best time for it. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I wanted to say that uh, this town is unusual because uh, unlike some other places, we have like a mixed use situation whereby we uh, we don't have to drive in each direction in 15 minutes just to get to a baker or, or get to coffee in the morning, which in other places in the country you do. There are other places, a lot of places, even in California, in the Bay Area, even where you have to have to drive somewhere and we have a mixed use kind of town that's like sort of pre-coded like some of the streets and some of the things that they would make today aren't the way they would do it here because it's not really even legal so we have kind of an unusual town and in in a way in that sense we are ahead of the game in that because we don't suffer those problems that they have to fix we have this mixed use situation already uh, however at some point we're going to have to deal with the problem of the war wagons. I mean, what I call the war wagons. And I, and I, I mean, these uh, massive 
heavy, giant trucks and vehicles that are clogging our streets. And I know it's a consumer decision, but I think we, we, we have an issue with this kind of thing because it's kind of like, uh, I think Chomsky back in the day used to say, it's like the celebration of the national economy. Each time there's a pothole, each time there's a rip, each there is something like where something needs to be fixed. Uh, become celebration of the national economy in the sense that someone has to be conjured out, someone has to do the work, uh, mechanics have to fix the cars, that's a, so forth, and so the snowballs. So we have this situation here where uh, the town is, uh, it, you can see the condition of the sidewalks and the streets and everything like that. We know the score of it. But I think that eventually we're going to have to deal with the situation. Know what, like I said, that we are a unique place in the sense that we are walkable, we are pedestrian, unlike some other places where you do have to drive in 15 minutes in each direction to get anywhere. So we're very, we have a very unique situation, but we have to try to eventually address these large, massive vehicles that are driving on our town. And we have to, at some, at some point, and I will speak about this again, we have to, we have to talk about some pedestrianization uh, scheme that they had done in the 1970s in Ghent in Belgium and in, in the Netherlands. It's got to happen. We gotta Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, at this time, we'll move to Zoom. Yes, there are some hands raised. Um, the first speaker is Kristen Omley. You're unmuted now, Kristen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. So an estimated 31.5% of Fairfax residents are 60 and above with an average age of 48. These numbers will continue to increase, especially for people 85 and above. By 2035, the number of people over 60 will outnumber those under 18 for the first time in the US. To support these changes, we all need to consider and address the needs of older adults as we make decisions that impact our town now and in the future. This includes performing direct outreach to and including the needs of the older population and caregivers as we discuss and create legislation and policy. It's important not to make assumptions about older adults because older adults and their needs are very diverse. I encourage everyone in Fairfax to work together to make changes to physical and social environments that support older adults. This includes imp improving access to businesses, employment, housing, outdoor spaces, transportation options, and community services for all older adults. I'm the Fairfax Commissioner on the Marin County Commission on Aging, and I can be reached via the town clerk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Jody Timms. Jody, whoops, you're unmuted now. Uh, good evening. Yes, Jody Tins, Fairfax resident for 30 years. I wanted to mention some important news I heard today on KCBS radio and later confirmed on the Internet. The county of Santa Clara posted on their official website that, quote, county supervisors upped the environmental ante on Tuesday, voting unanimously to adopt a goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2030, 15 years earlier than what was previously envisioned, end quote. Prior to this announcement, their goal was net zero by 2045, the same as the state of California. However, they seem to be well aware that society is not moving fast enough to address the climate emergency, and hence they moved their goal to 2030. Essentially, the same goal as the town of Fairfax, which is currently considering lowering its goal to 35 to 45% reductions. Even the state's goal is 48% by 2030, at least at the moment. I shared this news today with one of our county supervisors who I saw in person at the MCE Clean Air Day event, and she was quite surprised. Santa Clara's announcement went on to say, quote, this more demanding target is driven by a rising awareness of the dangers of climate change, including wildfires, extreme storms, and lethal heat waves. An urgency for decisive action is increasingly clear, end quote. The change I'd like to see Fairfax make to its goal is one from 100% zero emissions to net zero emissions by the same date we already have in place, 2030. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next speaker is Susanna. And Susanna, you're unmuted now. Good evening, town council members. My name is Sue Saunders, and I just want to say happy clean air day. Today, hundreds of Marin County kids walked or rode their bikes to school in support of Clean Air Day. It is in this vein that I wanted to speak tonight in support of Fairfax's goal of 100% electric vehicles by 2030. Why? Well, gas-powered cars release so much carbon, and every time we put carbon in the atmosphere, it stays there for hundreds of years. Gas-powered cars continue to build up the carbon levels, and if we think the extreme weather the country is already experiencing is bad, fasten your seatbelt. With the current carbon already released, we are in serious trouble. We cannot afford to continue using the atmosphere like a sewage dump. Fairfax's goal is what is needed. And in fact, as Jody Timms just said, Santa Clara just changed their goal to match yours. And San Jose did it in 2021 because both recognize the climate emergency we are in and have joined your goal. It may not be 100% possible to meet your goal, but that is not the point. The point is that the climate crisis needs this aspirational model. People need to understand that every gas car is a threat to our way of life. They are a threat to clean air, to a healthy planet, and to public health. That is the message you send, and I applaud it. As an EV advocate who spent the day celebrating Clean Air Day at a San Selmo Elementary School this morning, at an MCE's Clean Air Day event this afternoon, I believe in the goal of net zero by 2030. I took a parenting class years ago on teenagers and drugs. As a parent, you tell your children zero drugs and alcohol and hope they meet you part of the way. You set the goal high. Frankly, we need people to wake up to what the emissions coming out of gas cars is doing. I think people want to do the right thing and they just need to know what that is. Your AV plan is aspirational, educational, and is what we need to emulate. I hope you do not back down from your strong climate goals. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. How many more do we have, by the way, on Zoom? Uh, I see two more raised okay. hands. Great. The next speaker is Philip. You're unmuted. Hi there. Can you hear me? We sure can. Great. Um, I want to pick up on uh, what an earlier speaker in the room had to say about answering questions. I posed two really simple questions to the council tonight. I asked if you felt that the laws should be uniformly uh, applied to everybody in town. And I asked you if you would support a video camera. And I didn't hear an answer on either one of those things. And I, I really hope that you will have the courage to answer them and just say what you believe. It's, you have an opinion and um, you should share it as far as I'm concerned. Second point I want to make about the housing crisis. Um, rent control and rent stabilization has effectively stopped construction of ADUs and JEDUs. Why would anybody in their right mind spend $500 to $700 a square foot to build an ADU or a JADU if they were going to be subjected to arbitrary rent stabilization and rent control? Third point I'd make is I really feel that before you implement rent control or rent stabilization, you should allow the voters to have their voice heard in November of 2024. There's absolutely no reason to spend one dime on implementation if the voters are, uh, potentially would uh, turn that down in uh, 24. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Ava, you're unmuted now. Thanks. It's Ava. Um, I just want to uh, quickly uh, point out uh, you hear a lot about, you know, from a certain cohort of, of fairly wealthy white women in Marin County talking about, you know, the need for EVs. And I think that's all well and good. But if those same women aren't talking about reducing overall consumption, uh, then it's 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 a fraud. I'm sorry. I've been not driving a car for my entire life. I ride everywhere. I just did a 40 mile commute um, to Marin and back. And um, that's what's got to happen. And if you're just going to be uh, stripping, you know, precious minerals out of the Congo, and now they're going to have to start, they're already starting to mine 
the seafloor and you're not talking about reducing canals. Some of these people are driving, you know, EVs and then they're flying first class to Hawaii where they have their second homes. By the way, uh, the largest uh, homeless demographic in Hawaii is native Hawaiians. They've been entirely displaced uh, by, well, uh, you know, largely white Americans. Um, I also want to point out uh, that you you heard today from a nurse who works at San Quentin. I did want to point out that um, uh, last Sunday there was a hanging death at the Marin County Jail. This was the second hanging death in 51 days. Um, we have a problem with our jail. And unfortunately, that's not being resolved by Sheriff Civilian Oversight. If you want to read more about that, I have written about it at marincountyconfidential.substack.com. But I think, you know, uh, Mayor Catrano, I, I think it's nice that you mentioned the Human Rights Commission. They were uh, very involved in uh, messing that up. And unfortunately, our Human Rights Commission has a terrible record of corruption, including a $330 million Ponzi scheme run by Ken Casey, who is a Judy Arnold appointee. So I would just hope that people are more cognizant of uh, what what's actually going on. Thank you. The next speaker is Liz Fronenberg. Or, sorry, Liz. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? We sure can. Hi, um, I just wanted to um, respond real quickly. I don't know whether I should do it here or later, but there's um, the Ross Valley Reporter has recently been resurrected and they have a column called the Fairfax Forum. And there's a letter this week written in it talking about both um, the gas station issue, which I guess is coming up shortly. And I wanted to kind of align it with our Fairfax goal of 100% reliance on EV or carbon neutrality uh, by 2030, as stated in our climate action plan. I, I support <laughs> I support alternative forms of uh, of transportation. I would like to end the reliance on you know dinosaur bones as our way of getting around. But I do get concerned when I read. Oh yeah, we're going to be doing this by 2030. I'm not going to be able to afford to buy a vehicle by 2030. And I'm going to be, I think, 75 by that time. So it's unlikely that I'm going to be riding a, a bicycle uh, anywhere or, you know, most places. And then I want to also comment about the fellow who said earlier that we have a unique situation in that we have this kind of mixed ecosystem where we are lucky that we don't have to go 15 minutes everywhere to get most of our things done. But if we time out our gas stations uh, so that they can't be sold, et cetera, then we are going to be forced to having to drive either to San Anselmo or to Point Reyes to get our gas. And that's also going to really affect the people who drive through our place on the weekends, the tourists, as to where they're going to stop and get lunch, et cetera. So I just would like for our town to think a little bit more holistically about all of those things. And I just want to put a shout out to the Ross Valley Reporter. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Liz. There are no more raised hands. Okay, we will close open time for public expression and we will um, move on here to, oh wait, before we move on, one suggestion. Um, we have some folks that are here for item number three and I was wondering if um, I could have a motion to move item number three up to take that first. Is that possible? I'll make that motion. A second. You second it, uh, Councilmember Blash? Okay, so motion, second, Kohler Blash to move item number three regarding Live Oak up as the next item. Uh, could I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Eckerman? Yes. Councilmember Hellman? Yes. Councilmember Blash? Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler? Yes. And Mayor Petrano? Yes. All ayes, motion passes. Excellent, thank you. Um, do we have... Um, Mr. Lockerbie on Zoom? I am checking. Okay. Uh, Mark Lockerbie, could you please raise your hand on Zoom if you're there? I don't see him at this time, Mayor. 
Okay. Well then I guess we can't take that item right now. Um, so can I request that the town manager call Mark Lockerbie to see if we can do this because we do have people here and I think these other items are going to take some time and I don't think it's fair to make them wait. I need Mr. McIntosh to call Mark Lockerbie. Good evening. Can you hear us, Mark? You're on mute, I believe, so we cannot hear you. Okay, how about now? Now we can hear you, excellent. All right, I'm trying to get the light out of the way in the back. Sorry about that, I wasn't... Uh... I thought it was going to take a lot longer to get to my item. <laughs> we decided to move it up, but um, yeah, thanks for being game to join a little earlier. Sure. So uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item tonight is about um, a problem that we're having with the property with a lot of items that are uh, attracting uh, vermin and rats. Um, we've had a lot of uh complaints from the neighborhood about this uh, this item here. Um, there are programs available through the county, uh, the Hoarding Alliance of Marin, but it's up to the property owner to reach out to those um, to those groups to get help. And unfortunately, the only real tool that we have is code enforcement. And so I've written um, several letters requesting that the that the property be cleaned up i've also written a citation um, all of these have been ignored there's only uh, been two items that have been taken care of and that's uh, that i haven't seen water or food left out that uh, does not seem to be happening anymore so we're at this point now where we are asking you to um, basically um, abate the nuisance. So I'm a, I can read through some of this if you want me to, or I'm available uh, for questions. What do folks think? You have questions? I think we should just go to questions. Yeah, I, I've read the packet and it was pretty clear. Um, so, uh, Mark, it was, uh, as you said in the packet, you have, we went through this as a town, you went through this some years back. And uh, then the it was cleaned up after the order was, after the, the authorization was given to abate. So, um, this could be a repeat of that, but you're just asking council to to make the authorization to go ahead and do that abatement, and then maybe they'll clean it up. Maybe they won't, but it'll get cleaned up one way or the other. Yeah, that, be, correct. Yes, the last time it was it actually got cleaned up by the by the time we had the council meeting. 
Uh, this time I w I've been going by every day for the last few days. And uh, even as of today, there's been uh, no change at all. Any other questions? Okay, if there's none, um, we'll open this item for um, public comment. If anyone in the room wants to speak on this item, the public hearing is open. You just have to press the button. Duh. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paula Todd and I live next to our, this home. We're discussing um, Live Oak. Um, I believe her cleanup was done in 2008. And since that time, it's just growing and growing and growing. We spent thousands and thousands of dollars on cleaning up uh, rats and having protection from rodents. We've got her car out front, which is loaded to the top with um, rat droppings all underneath the car. It's been sitting there, I think, seven years. Um, it's a nuisance. It's 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 really disgusting, to be honest with you, and and not sanitary as well as a fire hazard. And um, again, she repeatedly refuses. And I've offered to help, our neighbors have offered to help, uh, whatever it might be, and um, nothing is happening. So that um, it's, it's very, very hard to live with to say the least. Um, and I would love to have something, finally someone hear us to have something take place. And I'm talking like 25,000 of dollars to some of our neighbors to get the rats out. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Gary Minoni. I live directly across the street from the property that's being discussed. Uh, I just want to back up everything that was just said by Paula. Um, it's It's been going on for months upon months with no improvement. Uh, the neighborhood is infested with rodents because of food left out. Um, it's an eyesore. And I only hope that Miss Bagan can be encouraged to do something about the problem. I think it would, it would benefit her as well as the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. First of all, uh, the property across there are I I know people who live. I've lived in Fairfax over fifty years, and I know people who who live in other parts of town and who live in the valley, and in the San Geronimo Valley, and they have rat rat problems. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, Anybody could prove, unless they do DNA tests, that the rats are all coming from my place. And I haven't, I I haven't left. I don't leave food out. Uh, there we have an apple tree between our houses, Paula Todd's house, which. She only bought a couple of years ago and moved in. She doesn't know about the things that happened before that. Anyway, she's been having constant work done on her house. She must have endless money. And she she has never really offered to to help me with anything. She's all she has work going on at her house constantly. I mean, there are it's been er almost just about every day since she's lived there that there are workers doing things there. And so I don't think it's just been about rats. I also showed her, uh, I sent her a message about uh, a, a friend of mine, somebody I know uh, who had been living, who had been living down the hill below us not close to my house. And I asked him if he had ever had rat problems. He had lived there for a long time. 
before he he had lived there longer than I had. And I asked him, and he was renting there. And his name is Donald Kinney. He's a photographer. He's just recently moved up to Petaluma, but he lived there for before I was there. And he, I asked him if he ever had rat problems, and he said yes. He said there are always rats around, and there are some people who live down on Willow who uh, were feeding were feeding deer, and it attract. They were feeding raccoons and deer, and that was attracting coyotes. And so, coy this was several years ago. Uh, coyotes were just uh, people's cats who were outside were disappearing and they figured the coyotes were getting them. As a matter of fact, one of the people who lives down below said uh, they saw their cat get taken by, by a coyote. So you know, anyway, I don't mean to interrupt, but your, your time is up. So if you could wrap up your comment. Okay. Uh, well, uh, anyway, I'm 81 years old. I have nobody to help me. Uh, I have very low income. I I had a bigger house previously at the end of Cascade Drive that I lived in for almost 30 years, never had any problems with any neighbors there. I'm still friends with some of them. And um, I found uh, these people who are living at, well, the man who spoke about, about uh, the man who's here who has the property across the street from mine, he has a big piece of property that he has never lived in. It's been 20 or 30 years since that he's owned it and nobody lives there. And he's he has his things stored there, but it's just hidden. So it's a real big piece of property. The house is abandoned. It's, it has... Uh, Tarps over the roof for years, it's had tarps over the roof, has fences falling down. All, and nobody complains about that because he's so nice and sweet to everybody and befriends everybody. And so uh, I think the, these, the, these people who have moved in right next to me now, uh, have a lot of money and have real nice houses and they just don't like the way my house looks. And there are other houses in the neighborhood that aren't any, that look the, as, as bad as mine. And my, I'm not, I'm not making noise. I'm not bothering anybody. Uh, it's all just on my property. It's just that I don't have a garage for storage. So I'm still, I lived in a much bigger house so I had a lot of things that wouldn't fit in this small house. And um, so I'm storing them in my carport and in the car that's sitting there, which doesn't work. The reason the car is parked there is because it doesn't work, but it's on my property, not doing anything on anyone else's property. I also reported to uh, the town and they assigned uh, Mark Lockerbie to take care of this problem that I had with the neighbor on the other side. I had a big, beautiful old olive tree there right in front of my house that was making it much more private and was giving me shade. And the neighbor went on to my property, the neighbor on the other side, not this one, but, uh, she went on to my, she's done, they've done all kinds of really mean things to me and lied about things. And she, when she knows I'm not there because my car is gone she, and she knows nobody else lives there, I live alone. And uh, she went on to my property and chopped up a lot of the branches off of my old oak tree without ever talking to me about it or, you know, discussing it with me. She also had a fence built further down the hill and veered it out onto my property. And so, Joanne, if you could it's, conclude your comment, that would be great. Um, okay. We'll have to move on to see if sure. there are any speakers on Zoom. Anyway, Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm just old now. I'm depre very depressed, chronically depressed. I've been seeing a psychiatrist and uh trying to get help. I also have fallen several times. Both of my wrists have been broken. This one was broken twice. And 
uh, never healed correctly. And so it hurts all the time. And I just can't do the work myself. And I don't have anybody else to help me or the money. I've used up my savings. And uh, I have a low income. I can't afford to hire people to help me. And when Mark Lockaby first, uh, first he told me, the first time we talked, he told me about it. He told me that he would try to find some people, his fellow workers to help with it. And I said, okay, great. And then I didn't hear it from him again. And uh, I waited and waited, didn't hear anything. And then, and I called him several times. He never returned my calls. And he has never, he never, he, I filed a complaint about the by tree being cut by the neighbors. And uh, when I wasn't there, and Joanne, well, he never, have to okay, conclude he, the... never, he never reported back about that. That was months ago. And I never heard, him. I asked. We'll, I heard... we'll, uh, we'll address it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other speakers in the room? Okay. Just an observation. Um, sadly, we certainly had rats come and go on our property. And so I've tried to figure out the best way to get rid of these rats without poisons and stuff, which I just do not support. It is true that the rats are very, um, um, they're very creative if we leave things out and they make them into homes because it's a little harbinger area. But what's really caused the rats, where I've noticed the rats go up and the rats go down, is when we leave out food, specifically bird food and cat food in that order. When we had chickens on the property, I had a battle with rats that just wouldn't end. When I finally had those tenants leave, and so the chickens left, the rats dropped off that side of the property. Recently, another little rat you know, group came up, and this was you could see where they had tried to go along the power lines and the bushes to get to a bird feeder. They had jumped, they had knocked seeds on the ground. And so they're going for those sources of food. With the creek, you have water. With the brew pub, you have grains and all those things. But they're still very manageable. But if people leave out dog food, cat food, and especially we've seen bird food, you're not going to beat them. They are tenacious. Just a comment. Thank you. Sorry, we have to keep taking comments, um, but we might ask questions later on, but yeah. Okay, Mark Bell. <clears throat> uh, Mark Lockerbie said that there were agencies who could help her. So maybe what really needs to happen is a reset with like a 30 day or a 60 day uh, window for stuff to get done. And so that would help as far as like her not not being fined and maybe taking care of the problem. Thank you. Can we go to his comments on Zoom? If there are any folks on Zoom? Yes, there is one speaker on Zoom. And Ava, you're unmuted now. I'll make this quick. This is so much the new Marin. I mean, you have someone who's elderly, who's 81 years old, who clearly needs a little assistance from her neighbors. Back in the day in Marin County, we would just be expected to help out elderly neighbors. Uh, you know, this was even in Southern Marin, in Mill Valley. We would, we would assist. We would assist with chores, um, cooking, stuff like that. This poor woman, she's got complaints from these wealthier neighbors. Um, you know, they could pitch in to help her out, but instead... This is, you know, this is what this county is like now. This is what happens when the income disparity becomes so extreme. I don't think a 60-day abatement would be enough. I think you have to give this person enough time. And I think you need to question the people who complained about her, um, those conditions, because it's clear that it's it cannot all be her fault. And it's also clear that um, that the social fabric um, in this county and in Fairfax itself has 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 been torn asunder. Uh, this is this is a community project. It'd be a great way um, to actually do something. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further speakers on Zoom. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Oh, look. sorry, there is. I'm sorry. One, Liz Froneberger. Okay. Yes. 
Thank you. Liz, you're unmuted now. Hi, I just want to say that um, I've worked with Mark in the past, uh, helping to abate a neighbor of mine, and he was nothing but helpful. And so for him to take it this far, I have to assume that there's a reason. And also, I just, I also want to respond to the previous speaker, who is just so ready to, to damn neighbors over something like this, you really don't have any idea how much someone is willing to accept help, et cetera, and what the other underlying issues are. So I, I wish people wouldn't so readily jam neighbors when it comes to this. That said, Mark did say that there were programs available and maybe that's all that needs to happen. But um, I just wanna kind of stick up for Mark because I feel like he has been really, really helpful and tolerant and understanding and um, has been helpful in the past, I'm sure to more people than just me. And it wasn't my next door neighbor, he was helping to <laughs> abate the situation. It was someone who was several blocks away and yet he was very kind and considerate as were uh, those neighbors. Okay, thanks. Thank you. No more hands. Okay, we'll close the public hearing on this item and take it back to the council. So um, I guess for folks who haven't seen the pictures, I've actually gone to look at the property and there really needs to be removal of these materials and it's against our code to have inoperable vehicles. I also know that rats like to chew those wires, particularly in things like Honda Elements. Um, the the program that's available to help is a low, in, low interest loan program through the Marin Housing Authority. And I understand that Mark has provided that information to Joanne. What I suggest is maybe you could let me finish, Joanne. You've made a lot of comments and I I think we're all pretty empathetic. I, I know your situation is very difficult. Um, what I would suggest is that we move forward with the abatement to help her out. And I know the staff report talks about staff uh, returning to council to charge the property owners and do a lien on the property. Well, I realize it's premature. I would just say this is a very unfortunate situation. And at that time, I would make a motion that we just get this done and not charge the property owner and just remove this material. Um, there is quite a lot of material there and the car, you know, is, is harboring rats. And one of the things Mark didn't touch on is he went out with the mosquito and vector abatement district who did send a letter. So I realize it's a very sad situation and um, I don't know how much neighbors have offered to help, but I think we can get this done and clean it up. And while there are rats in my neighborhood as well, it usually happens when people put out food and, um, you know, I think it's time to just get this cleared up. For folks who are not aware, Mark started this back in September 2021. And I can attest to Mark's kindness and really trying to help where he can and taking a number of years to get to this point because he did have hopes that we could um, that this would get fixed without taking it to this step. So that's my comments, and I'm happy to make a motion, but I'm sure other folks want to speak on this. Thank you. Other folks? I can give it a try. So yeah, this is obviously a difficult situation, and I feel for, for your situation and and for the neighbors, um, it seems like that stuff has got to go. It's not doing you any good. The car is, it, you said it wasn't working and, and now, well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm speaking at this point and I, I'm not, I'm not discussing it with you. I'm just telling you my thoughts and telling the public and the rest of the council, my thoughts. So I'll just look out into space. Um, the car 
is is ruined. It's obviously ruined. It isn't going to do any good to leave it there. If it's got rats infested in it, then everything in it is ruined. So there can be no benefit to putting it off. It it just should be towed away. And that doesn't even cost that much. One towing thing and then donate the car, be done with it. Um, I, I support what, along the lines of what Councilmember Kohler was saying, that it seems like the abatement needs to be done. It would be, I hate to see it be charged, but on the other hand, I don't know whether the council really is, whether it's really appropriate for council to expend public funds for one person as opposed to um, in a general way. Maybe I can get a, a the thoughts from our legal counsel on that. That's a discussion to be had when it comes back, when you actually have the cost. Okay. And one possibility, I'm not quite sure how this could be structured, but if we can, along the lines of what some folks were saying, that, you know, back in the day, a small town like this, we would just help each other out. And from what I understand, there's already been some offers to help out, but those offers haven't been accepted. Maybe one way that could be helped out would be if some of the cost of the abatement, the town could just go ahead with the abatement and get it done. And then if if anybody wanted to help out, if any of the neighbors wanted to help out by helping to defray the cost of that so there's not such a lien put on the owner's property, that might be a way that they can help out and we can just but I'm not sure whether we can expend, at least at this time tonight, I don't see how we can uh, we can authorize expenditure of the town's funds to do it, but I'm in favor of getting the abatement done. Hi, I'm definitely in favor of getting the abatement done and I sympathize with all parties. I, I know it gets really overwhelming, these circumstances. Um, I'd like to understand how the lien works. Do you essentially, the town incurs the cost and then when the sale of the property happens, is that what, what could you so, just explain the, the uh, how, how the lien works? The process is that you declare something that's in violation of your code to be a public nuisance and you order the nuisance to be abated. And then we hire a contractor who goes and cleans everything up. And then we get a bill for that. And um, prior, I should say prior to that, after the council declares a public nuisance, you give the property owner one more chance to clean it up before you hire a company who cleans it up. Then we get the bill. Then we come back to council. Mark will come back to council with another staff report saying, okay, I, I followed your direction and I had the property cleaned up. Here's the bill. What do you want to do with it? We suggest that you um, add it to the property taxes. And since um, we are under a teeter plan in this county, we present it to the county assessor prior to August 10th of each year, and it goes on the property tax rolls. And so the county collects the money for us, but we don't have to wait for that. The county pays us, the uh, reimburses the town for that expense, and it goes on the property tax bill. And you can decide how much you want to put on the property tax bill. So that's a topic for a, a second hearing when we come back. It's right. not a topic but that was helpful. Now. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. I guess I, I'm aware of two other properties that are in similar conditions. So I'm concerned about setting a precedence for this, for using public funds and town funds for this. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I, no. I, we can't. I, Sorry, I we're doing do council comments right now. Sorry. Sorry. I I guess I just wanted to say, um, you know, I have looked at um, the many, many letters that Mark has sent and the many times that he's gone by. So I think he's really done due diligence. This wasn't like a one off kind of decision. Um, and I did want to note that there are a number of letters that say, if you have questions regarding this matter or need financial assistance in order to comply, please feel free to contact me. And that's repeated in letter and letter after letter after letter. Um, so I know that he's attempted to provide um, resources or, or, or referrals to resources. Um, I'm not sure if those resources could be accessed now, if they're just entirely inappropriate. But um, I just wanted to put out there that I have looked through this and have seen that he has tried repeatedly to refer resources. Thank you. Um, 
Is that all your comments, Councilmember Blash? Because then I'll share my comments as well. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I I appreciate everyone's comments on this, and it's not um, it's it's not one of those easy situations, um, especially after Kristen gave that really important speech during open time about just folks aging in Marin and um, more and more challenges with figuring out what to do with all the stuff that we we collect and maintaining the stuff that we have and figuring out where to store stuff when we downsize, which is the right thing to do is trying to figure out how to downsize um, to fit your your lifestyle as it changes. And then you have more stuff um, and it and it just becomes one of those tasks that builds up. And then they're, you know, I, 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 I understand because I've, I, um, yeah, definitely have family members that also have a, a challenge with, um, taking on, taking on that big task. And I think, um, I, I really appreciate hearing all the different perspectives on it. I, I am really concerned that Mark has, you know, been gently trying to, uh, bring this issue forward, um, over the last couple of years. And, um, it doesn't seem like there's been as much movement on it. Um, I think this is the, the next, uh, natural step is to, to move forward as, um, staff have recommended and it'll come back to us at, at some point with, you know, that status update and then the costs associated. But I think it, it makes a lot of sense to, um, yeah, help address the issue just, head on right now um, because it's been years in the making and also because it's not the first time this issue is, has come up, but there have been issues associated with this going back to, to 08. So um, yeah, I, you know, I know it's hard and, and happy. I'm, I'm sorry. We're, we're not able to do any more public comment at this point in time. Sorry, Joanne, we're, we're, um, not taking more public input at this time, but, um, yeah. So I'll make a motion, excuse me, Joanne, uh, to adopt the attached resolution declaring the conditions on the property to be a public nuisance and specifically order the town manager to cause the abatement of the nuisance by hiring a contractor to remove the various debris on and under the carport hire a towing company to remove the inoperable Honda Element automobile. Prior to abatement by a contractor and towing company, the owner shall, will be given notice and a final 10-day period of time in which to remedy the listed code violations on the property. Any abatement will be completed in accordance with applicable law. And then town staff will return to council at a future date to report on the abatement and request the costs of the abatement be charged to the property owners as a special assessment lien on the property. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second that and just a comment to the neighbors to just, she's gonna be having a hard time with this. So try to be good neighbors and watch out for her. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Kohler Ackerman, could I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Mayor. Councilmember Ackerman? Yes. Councilmember Hellman? Yes. Councilmember Blash? Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler? Yes. Mayor Cutrano? Yes. All ayes, motion passes. Okay. Thank you very much. And I guess we will hear, hear back from you, Mark, um, after... You give notice the the final ten. Could you days take the to... conversation outside, please? Sorry. Okay. Um. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mark, for your time. Yep. And for everything you do. With that, we'll move on. Uh, back to the first two items. Um, for the public hearings. So we have a public hearing to. Introduce and read by title only an ordinance amending the town's zoning code to prohibit new gas filling service stations and prohibit expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure for existing gas filling service stations. Uh, and it's a CEQA categorically exempt item. Uh, town Manager Abrams. Good evening. 
Um, I'll try to be extremely brief. I know we're already well into the evening. Um, so this is a, an ordinance that you have seen a draft of um, be twice before. Um, the Planning Commission reviewed it as well. And um, it the purpose is um, in keeping with our climate action goals to um, prohibit the development of new gas stations um, throughout the town. Um, uh, basically make it so that um, current gas stations can continue to operate, but um, not to expand their um, fossil fuel uh, gas pumping. And then of course, to update the code definition um, so that um, uh we can add that definition of zero emission um, vehicle. And um, we have uh, done a significant amount of outreach to the two current gas stations um, and uh, neither have expressed concern um, or any real interest in this. Um, and that includes um, three different letters that was sent to them. Um, with no reply. And then um, we actually physically went out to the gas stations and also um, tried to reach the owners by phone. So I just wanted to mention that. And um, then if you have questions about the ordinance and there was a supplement um, today, um, I would turn that over to our town attorney. Yes, Vice Mayor Kohler. I do have a question, but maybe what we need to do is we hit 10 o'clock. And so I would make a motion that at this point we should continue on. Yep. Does someone want a second? Second. second. Okay. Kohler Blash to waive the 10 o'clock rule. If we get a roll call vote, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Council Member Hellman. Yes. Council Member Blash. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Oh, yes. And Mayor Cutrano. Yes. All eyes motion passes. Okay. So I, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, I think there's been some information sort of going on in town. It's my understanding that since the gas stations operate under a conditional use permit that runs with the land, so should a current owner of the gas station decide to sell it, it's my understanding that they would not be precluded from selling that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And the other thing is, um, I guess I went into Novato's to try to find, one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that the existing gas stations, for example, if they had a leaking underground fuel tank, could actually fix that. And there were a number of conditions that I had asked for um, that would allow the existing gas stations to do work if necessary, um, to be not expand their filling stations, but there's a number of provisions. And I just wanna clarify that those were all captured. And I know we have the supplement which captured uh, one area that I had brought up. So I just want to make sure that that's understood. Yes, that was, yes, that's what the supplement does. So we are working hard to make sure that they can remain in business as is, they can't expand, right. but they can do the work necessary if there's a fire or a flood, right? that they can repair those gas stations but our goal here is to make sure that there aren't any new gas stations and should they go out of business that we want to move forward and allow other uses. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for the supplement, uh, town clerk, as well as our legal counsel. Any other questions? I don't have any questions, but I appreciate the work that, uh, particularly council member Kohler did to really try to make this as clear as possible in every way. And I think it's well reflected in here that the, this is putting 
no limitations on the existing businesses. Um, Except they can't expand. They can't with expand, filling states. Expand their. They can't add more pumps, essentially, or add more tanks. They can't do that kind of thing. But there's not much room to do that there anyway, and they don't seem to have any interest in doing so. Or if they, but, I think the one gas station is large enough that if they wanted to add electric charging, they they, they, they are allowed that. to do that, they and they have room for that. that. And the conditional use, if they sell the business, the conditional use permit stays with the. Correct. Right. Okay. Could we just that there's a false narrative in the community related to that. Could we just capture that please for the minutes? I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I don't have any questions and we should probably go to comp. Great. Well, we will open this up to, uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item, I should say. So if uh, folks in the room would like to speak, this is the time. Please make your way to the podium. And then folks on Zoom, please raise your hand and we will get to you in short order. First speaker. Todd Greenberg here. There is a lot of false narratives going on in this town. And um, maybe the audio guy can help Miss Hellman out because of the audio here. Um, so, uh, the gas tax revenues are being threatened here. This has come up before this town council three times now that I'm aware of, and each time we've spoken against it, there is other false things here. I just heard the town manager say that nothing had been said. Well, one of the gas station owners hasn't even been contacted. I understand from reading the staff report that people tried to contact them, but I don't see that any certified letter has been sent. It says a letter was sent. Well, maybe it was missed. Maybe it went to the wrong address. I don't think you tried hard enough. And I don't think you tried hard enough for Fairfax because what you're threatening here is a million two hundred and sixty eight thousand and one dollars worth of sales tax revenue, according to the current fiscal report, and $410,000 and $351 of gas tax revenue, all because you want to legislate the future beyond the current technological capabilities and economic or technological capabilities that exist for transportation because you have aspirational goals. Aspirational goals are great, but you need to get down to reality here. Okay? That's just not making sense. Ignoring us doesn't make sense. There's th four main arguments here. No one in this town wants this. Frank and I and Michael McIntosh and Deb London and others have spoken against this and they've at last report tried but not made contact with owners. I mentioned that. This will likely encumber the ability of owners in different ways. It will in the future reduce revenues to other businesses when travelers no longer stop in Fairfax for gas. That's what I was talking about, the sales tax and gas tax revenues that will no longer happen here. How do you plan to make up those revenues? Thank you, Todd. That's your time. I just want to clarify that the town manager sent those letters by certified mail. I did not send them by certified it mail. It says that in the staff report. Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to double check then, okay. but we've sent letters three times and we've made multiple phone attempts and okay. physical attempts. Okay. Next speaker, please. Sorry. I'm trying to stop laughing. Oh. When was the last time somebody tried to put a gas station in Fairfax? How many years ago? That's where the way station is now. Guy came. How many years ago was that? How many applications for a gas station have come in since then? I'm going to guess zero. So why do you need a law? The marketplace is dictating no one's going to come here and put in a gas station. So you just spent more money on legal time and in the meantime a kitchen here at the women's club is full of single-use plastic cups 
single-use utensils, and the dishwasher that's there was running on phantom power until I turned it off. So why this hypocrisy? You know, you want, oh, we have to have this goal. We have to, the goal is being taken care of all by itself. Why don't you spend time on figuring out ways that the town doesn't burn down? Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, please. Frank Ager from the Cascades. You know, at one time, Fairfax had about 10 gas stations, and we're down to two. I would not call that an oversaturation of gas stations. <laughs> the last time there was an application for a new gas station in Fairfax was in 2013, uh, and that was Chevron. The Fairfax Town Council denied that application for a gas station. They were able to deny it because Fairfax has such excellent town codes to prevent a new gas station in Fairfax. This this ordinance is really overkill. You know, Fairfax will not be close to your, your electric goal of 100% of in six years. It might reach 15% of all vehicles. That means 85% of the, of, of the vehicles in Fairfax will still need a gas station. By removing gas stations as illegal conforming use, Fairfax is, in effect, banning gas stations. The Rhino Station is a mom-pop operation. They fix flats, charge batteries, replace brakes, and other small vehicle repairs. Rather than trying to outgreen the rest of the cities in California, there's 482 of them, I'd suggest Fairfax initiate an electrical conservation program. We just can't keep using more and more energy all the time and expect it to come from, I don't know where, nuclear or wherever. Conservation works with water. It'll work with electricity. We don't need this ordinance tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Yes, Town Council. Um, first, I'd like to say that it is my opinion and certainly something that we can support that the overall footprint electric vehicle and take the materials out of the earth and how do you recycle the batteries and create the, the power wherever it comes from so we can support those electric vehicles actually is greater damage to the earth than a gas carbon producing car. That aside, the reason we've got so many electric vehicles is because of the incentives to try to get us so we could see and use alternative energy sources, which I support. But the current electrical grid in this state is so overused that now we're extending the life expectancy of two different nuclear power plants that were supposed to be shut down. How is that safe for our environment? But there's going to be a consequence even in this town by removing these gas stations. That is currently a depository source right in our town. If we need to go get a fuel, we can go there. We don't have to drive all over the place. If the gas stations are gone and shut down, we're going to have to drive San Rafael or San Anselmo or somewhere else to get our gas. And then we're going to start storing it by our house. So that when they cut down our electrical grid, we can fill those little generators to charge our car, to charge our house. We want to give people an alternative choice. They're not supporting keeping big cans of gas by their house in the event of the electrical grid or blackouts. So, I mean, think about that also. Recently, I went through the Ford power plant and we're listening to different executives from Ford and different divisions and a true cost, these battery packs like on the F Lightning. There's actually nine in that pack and there's $60,000. I can't speak to some of the other vehicles because that was the one in hand. Ford has already realized the inefficiency of the electric vehicles and they're trying to already move it past the solid oxide fuel cells and directly into hydro hydrogen. If we could get into an hydrogen model, I support that wholeheartedly. 
but taking away an alternative and something that we rely on when we have no electricity is really a poor thought. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. There is a wrinkle in this, and that is that, uh, and I've been following this thing with the companies in Rishni Sunak in England, because he had just kind of walked it back to 20, uh, 2035 because of this um, this thing that's going on back and forth. And the, the companies are planning basically to, to keep, um, well, to produce as much as they can within the next five years. So what this looks like to me by looking at back and forth is that they're not going to be out of this until about 20, 50, 60 or so. And that's a, it's a whole different ball game. I, I think that in fact, I think that the uh, you know, recently walk back just makes it clear that I think that we're going to be dealing with um, the production of these things for a, a lot longer than they projected. The other wrinkle is that I think that, you know, our town that doesn't really have the infrastructure like the, they're thinking like they're going to build these uh, charging stations that are like airport parking lots or something like that, where people are going to be sitting there. I don't think we have a situation like that. Uh, I would like to see them stop talking about EVs and start talking about trains myself, but that's just my opinion. I leave it up to you guys. Thank you for your comment. Any folks with their hands raised on zoom? Yes, mayor. All right. The first speaker is PJ Pfeffer, and you're unmuted now. Hey, thank you, uh, PJ Pfeffer. Uh, to be clear, speaking solely on behalf of myself as an individual, it's my own opinion. Um, I was not planning on speaking, but just wanted to highlight, you know, how these things can sometimes be derailed, it seems like. You know, there's a, a regular contingent looking to find a boogeyman in every agenda item uh, and in doing so overlook some basic realities uh, in this instance in particular, you know, the, the idea of tax money going away or uh, one of the speakers mentioned, you know, getting rid of the gas stations and went into, you know, like a whole imagined scenario with people hoarding gas in a, some sort of apocalyptic situation. But what the ordinance does is actually make it easier for these gas stations to operate as they've been operating. They're allowed to keep operating as they've been operating. They, anybody who buys the property from them can operate them the same way they've been operating. So uh, the situation as is shouldn't be changed at all. And in fact, you know, this ordinance is really giving them a legal monopoly. It's saying no competitor to your business can ever enter the market. In a situation like that, you'd think a business would be more incentivized to invest in, in its own maintenance and its own upkeep because they're knowing that their investment is protected. They're not going to spend a lot of money cleaning up their their site, making sure that their tanks are running well, uh, making sure that their business is as efficient as possible. They know that that money is going to be protected because no big business is going to come in and compete with them and push them out of the market. Uh, you know, it's it's odd because this really seems like it's actually very good for them unless they had big designs to expand their footprint drastically. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Liz Fronberger, and you're unmuted now. Hi, everybody. I assume you can hear me. Um, I'm all for supporting the limitation to two gas stations, and thank you for clearing up. I think I understood that these owners can, can continue their business as they have before, and they can sell these businesses, and the businesses can go on without uh, material change, I mean, basically. Uh, but I do have a question. On page uh, three of the staff report, the first paragraph, it speaks about, uh, I think it's, let's see, it's the second sentence. If use of a gas station under an existing CUP is discontinued for a period of at least 12 months, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It sounds like that gas station cannot continue and might lose uh, their right to continue to operate. But then on, uh, see, section three, uh, paragraph C, um, number nine, it's it speaks about uh, having a period of of two years from the date of damage or destruction to restore it, uh, but and that has to be completed within two years. 
I keep reading those two paragraphs over and over again, and they seem like they're in conflict. Um, so I'm just pointing that out. Maybe I'm not understanding it, um, but I just wanted to make sure that these filling stations don't have to continually reapply for operating and correction permits every 180 days, which is what that earlier paragraph says. Okay, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Can, before we have another comment, because there was just a couple things in there that need to be corrected and unpacked. Uh, Town Attorney Colson, would you mind, or, or Tom Andrew Abrams um, addressing the question? Uh um, put simply, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to have the attorney um, put it into more legal language, but one circumstance is where the um, business is continuing to operate but needs to make repairs. So there's a limitation there, which is longer, right, because we um, had discussion at the Planning Commission and also um, at the Council about um, how long repairs can take and that we, uh, the council did not want to um, put the existing businesses out of business, but simply to um, make sure that in the case where a business closed and they were closed for a year, then, then uh, someone else couldn't come back later and reopen as if it had never closed. So it gives those two different periods uh, depending on the circumstance of the business. Thank you. I think that that's satisfactory. Um, next speaker. Ava is the next speaker and Ava, you're unmuted now. I'm sorry, I I did not mean to raise my hand. Thank you. There are no further speakers on Zoom, Mayor. Okay, we will close the public hearing on this item and take it back to the dais. Councilmember Ackerman. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, there were a number of comments made that really need to be spoken to. As far as, uh, I think it's been made clear, I can't imagine that it could be made any clearer that this ordinance is not in any way designed to, and in fact, it's explicitly really working hard to make sure it does not do anything to remove or hurt the existing stations, or even if those those owners want to sell their business, that could be done. So there is nobody removing the gas stations. And so I don't think we need to worry about people hoarding gas because there's no gas anywhere in Fairfax. Um, the uh, I, I really need to, to go back to the history, if we're going to bring it up, of the last time that a gas station was, we had an application for a gas station in Fairfax at 2001 Sir Francis Drake, which used to be a gas station. Fairfax Gas was what it was last called. And uh, then they closed sat there closed for a while. And then there was an application that came in for that site from uh, a Chevron franchisee. And there was enormous town outcry against that. If you, if anybody was here at that time and recalls that, there was an enormous town outcry against it. There was nobody in town that wanted to see that there. And uh, in fact, a lot of people who are currently active in town came out and became active at that point. Um, I just have to point out that it wasn't because the town code prevented that from being, for that application from being accepted. It was actually approved by, by the Planning Commission because the Planning Commission could not come up with the findings in the existing town code at that time to deny the application, even though they didn't particularly like it. Um, what actually stopped that from happening was the, the general plan, because the general plan had a, the, uh, a notion in there of a possible other use for that land, and the general plan called for keeping that space open for a, 
possible street to cut through there. And that was the reason that it ultimately, that when it was a directed referral was brought to town council, that was what actually was able to prevent that from going forward. I imagine that there might also have been that the applicant, the franchise, potential franchisee might have just decided that they saw the opposition in town and maybe they decided, I certainly would if I were them, decide that they didn't really want to try to fight the entire town to have their business here. But I don't know what their thinking was, but the application was dropped. It never went to to a legal, uh, legal battle, but that was actually what stopped it. Since then, the code has been cleaned up because the CH zone was uh, at that time did not include the formula business ordinance was not um, it did not cover the, the CH zone and that has now been fixed. So um, anyway, there was an interesting history and uh, what's especially interesting tonight is how well, there was just absolutely unanimous and huge opposition to that gas station being located in town. So I just wanted to say with regard to this, and I certainly support this ordinance and would be happy to make a motion to um, to pass it, that the this is not just about gasoline, although that is a huge issue. I think it's it's not an ideology; it's just a reality that we're going to quit burning the carbon that was put in under the earth millions of years ago and releasing into the atmosphere and expecting the climate to stay the same. That's that's not an ideology. That's just what it is, and it's happening going to happen everywhere. We can talk about whether it's going to happen in five years or 15 years, but the time frame is going to be, it's going to be fast. But, and so as far as the gasoline, it's, uh, it's a matter of the town reacting to the changing circumstance in an intelligent way. And it seems to me that for the town, to allow more gas stations to be built when those gas stations would be among the last gas stations on earth. And they will eventually will end up with, with a place that now has uh, a tank under ta under the ground that has to be cleaned up possible spills. Cause these tanks often end up leaking. We've had leaks in this town from the gas station that at 2001 Sir Francis Drake, that one of the reasons those redwood trees al along there, uh, along that little parking extension of the parkade are kind of scrawny, excuse me, kind of scrawny, from my understanding, is because there's a plume of gasoline under there from that gas station. It's nasty stuff. It's not good to have gas stations around. And so, you know, we're lucky to only have two and we have enough i think so why we're, and we're not saying we're going to have less we're not limiting that so seems to me to be simply prudent to um to take this step um it also is there's the land use that we don't have that many spaces in town to have a business and so this allows us to have other businesses that that could be, for example, the Bicycle Museum is a place that, that was at one time a gas station. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And, um, you know, that's that, there are businesses that could happen besides gas stations that might have more benefit to the town than having a third gas station or a fourth gas station. So for for those reasons, I am in favor of this ordinance and I think we should Thank do you. it. Yes, please, Vice Mayor. Um, well, I have a question, but I also want to clarify that I was the one who made the findings to kill the Chevron gas station. It was, um, there were elements in the town code, but it was quite a feat to do that. Um, I want to ask a question, oh, and there's still a typo in the supplement. Um, so Liz Fraunberger brought up that on page three of the staff report, it talks about, and you just responded to this town manager, that if a gas station is discontinued for a period of at least 12 months, the use will be considered terminated and will no longer be legal nonconforming. 
okay, there is nothing in the ordinance that talks speaks to 12 months. What is in the ordinance is speaks to 180 days with the ability to extend 180 days. And I believe that what's in the staff report was based on what was originally in this when we first took it up, which was originally 12 months. And then the majority of the council reduced it to 180 days with the ability to extend. So if there's something I'm missing, having no. read this many times. But you're think... correct. That's the way that it reads. It, that, that paragraph starts by talking about the current non-conforming use regulations under chapter 17. And then it goes on to talk about the changes from oh. 12 months to the 180 days with the opportunities for extensions. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I missed you're correct. It. No, you're and correct. And then just to point out the typo that I brought up five times is on page three of the supplement, number two, after the word operating, in the first line, there's an extra G. It's not a big deal, but let's remove that G, please. And then whoever wants to make the motion or continue to talk. And in, in terms of the time frame, there's there's another time frame in there, which is that after a disaster, people of the gas no, I, would I have an extended that, time to rebuild. But I think the mayor just clarified where I missed the point. Do you are you willing to second Ackerman's I, motion? Well, he hasn't made the motion. Yet. Would I would be happy to, but if go ahead Congress and make the motion. Flash has something to to say. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll just say quickly that um, I was daunted by the 180 days um, initially when I read this, but I do see that it can be extended. Um, so I am happy to see that there is the flexibility for somebody who needs more time. Um, because it can take a long time to make repairs. And um, I, I I do wonder how hard it would be, like we determined suddenly that we needed more gas stations, you know, could we just repeal the ordinance and do something else? Um, I thought that was kind of the concept of ordinances that you can amend them or repeal them if you need to. So um, just wanted to ask how hard that would be if we had to, if some emergency happened where suddenly we needed tons of gasoline, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I will I will move that we introduce wave first reading and read by title only an ordinance amending section seventeen point zero zero eight point zero twenty definitions and seventeen point zero nine six zero fifty conditional uses and structures and adding a new section seventeen point zero one six zero eighty regulation of non-conforming filling service station uses and structures to Title 17 of the Fairfax Municipal Code and finding the action exempt from CEQA. A friendly amendment based on the supplement, supplement. and also with the one minor change. And removing that Move wayward G. G. But you have to, <laughs> so based on the supplement, okay, I would say Based second. on Based on the supplement that uh, with corrections. Okay, and I'll second that motion. Great. We have a motion, Ackerman, second, Kohler. We have a roll call vote, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Council Member Hellman. Yes. Council Member Blash. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yes. Mayor Cutrano. Yes. Motion passes, all eyes. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone who made it possible. It's great. Yeah. Um, uh, the vice mayor just reminded me to mention that I believe we're continuing or it's, or, uh, yeah, item number four was withdrawn. So that will not be on tonight's agenda. Correct. Yes, mayor. Great. Um, so we have, uh, item number two, um, and that is to introduce and read by title only an ordinance relating to inclusionary housing requirements, um, and in lieu fees and linkage fees. Jeff. Yes, I'll be giving that presentation. Allow me to share my screen here. Just a short PowerPoint. Oh, there we go. 
Okay, so this evening we'll be discussing um, the introduction of an ordinance and then the adoption of two resolutions that are all related to one another. Um, and so collectively, we worked on this with, the, with other jurisdictions in Marin County, and we were able to um, use an SB2 grant to cover the expense of the fee studies and the code work. So, um, and, and and the other thing that's good about that is we, because it's a cooperative effort, then the rules are similar in all the jurisdictions. So the jurist, you know, developers wouldn't necessarily get an advantage by building in one jurisdiction versus another jurisdiction. Um, and so, just go right. Th so the two studies were <clears throat> completed um, by Strategic Economics and Verazzo Wolf Associates. Uh, we do have a requirement if there's an impact fee, a development impact fee, um, you have to comply with AB 602. Um, and so the in lieu fee is not considered an impact fee. So that isn't subject to 602. However, the linkage fee is. <clears throat> and then the um, the study verif verified that we can indeed charge the linkage fee. <clears throat> And we are submitting for reimbursements, as I mentioned, under the SB2 grant. So the overall benefits of this um, are increasing the supply of affordable housing, um, greater opportunity for low-income renters and homeowners, uh, decreased economic and racial segregation, create healthier mixed-income communities. So there was a project size threshold established. Um, so if you are a building just a single home or um, an ADU, JADU, duplex, triplex, you would not be subject to these requirements. It's only if you would, were to build a fourplex or larger. So that's kind of the minimum size threshold for the in lieu fee. Um, there is also, this is how it would work in terms of the affordable set-asides. So the developer is required to either build a certain percentage of total units as affordable or pay the in lieu fee. So I, I so it's 15% for rental properties and 20% for ownership um, projects. And that was discussed at an earlier council meeting to, to make that distinction. Uh, there was a, a preliminary discussion that I saw on the record of doing 20% for both. And then it was decided to go down to 15% for the rental projects. So the in lieu um, fee would be um, $362,816 for single family subdivisions and rental units, and then $288,540 for condominiums. And then that was the purpose of the study to kind of establish that fee based on construction costs um, in Marin County. So this is just an example of how this would potentially work. So if you, for hypothetically, you have a 10 unit rental project, 15% uh, of 10 is you know 1.5. So the obligation from the developer would be to provide 1.5 um, um, units that are affordable to low-income households. So there's a couple of options on how to meet this requirement. They could build one affordable unit and pay the inclusionary fee for 0.5 units. Uh, the code allows you to pay a fee for a fractional unit. Uh, you could also pay the fee for all 1.5 units, or you could round up and just build two um, affordable units. And either one of those scenarios would meet the inclusionary um, ordinance. So the commercial linkage, this is obviously the one that applies to commercial development. So there was a, a linkage fee. So there is now they were, There would be a linkage fee established for of $3 per square foot. And then the minimum threshold for that would be 5,000 square feet. Anything under that would be exempt. Um, the study results, um, they studied scenarios up to $15 per square foot. And the, and the fee studies, you could go much, much higher than that. Um, but we decided to set that at $3 per square foot um, to not be a too much of a disincentive to new commercial developments. And this would be, the $3 would be consistent with other, what other jurisdictions are establishing in Marin County. And so this balances the need for affordable housing while, while supporting local businesses. 
The other thing that is established within the ordinance is an affordable housing fund, um, and it can only be used for affordable housing projects. Um, there is also an alternative means of compliance, which is required by state law for rental properties. Um, so you could, you know, you could pay the in lieu fee, you could do offsite construction, you could have land dedication, you could do rehabilitation of existing units. So there's a number of different ways that you could meet the the code requirements besides um, just building units or paying the in lieu fee. So at the planning commission, there was a couple of concerns raised. Um, there was a concern about the use of funds and who would get to direct the use of funds. And it was clarified that those, those would come in front of the town council. Any Anything that's budget related or finance related would have to be authorized by the town council for the use of the um, affordable housing fund. So the second concern with the planning commission was um, wanting to focus the resources from the inclusionary housing fund in the or the and also the in lieu fund on low income households. Um, so they, they weren't so concerned about moderate income. And so they wanted that focused, uh, but that was not a consensus. Some of the commissioners wanted to leave it as is and, and have it remain flexible. So they could also, it could be used for moderate income households as well. Um, and we also adopted an errata sheet where we found um, some errors in the ordinance, uh, mostly typos and that sorts of thing. Um, and other clarifications. So we incorporated all of those changes into the ordinance that's in front of you um, tonight. So the recommendation would be to adopt an ordinance to, to add a new chapter, 17140. Um, it would provide for inclusionary housing requirements, establish an affordable housing fund, authorize affordable in lieu fees, and authorize commercial non-residential linkage fees. There's also a resolution which would adopt affordable housing requirements um, to implement the ordinance. Um, so that's a, a separate standalone resolution. Um, and the reason to do that is so you don't have to codify absolutely everything into the ordinance. You can have this freestanding resolution that can be more easily updated if needed in the future. Um, and then there's also a resolution which adopts the affordable housing and lieu fees and the linkage fees. And again, you have a separate resolution so that you can you can change it in the future more easily. And with that, I'm available for, for questions. And I should also mention Kylie Otto with the city attorney's office is um, available on Zoom uh, to bail me out if, if needed. So anyway. Excellent. Councilman Breckerman. Um Thank you for your work on this. A uh, couple of things. One, uh, this is, as as I understand in the staff report, the the detailed ordinance that, or detailed ordinance and two resolutions that are coming before us tonight have, and, and the study was done not only by Fairfax, but uh, in partnership. Correct, with it was towns. done collectively. I mean, I would say the ordinance was done specifically for Fairfax but the studies were done collectively with other jurisdictions and then they did a special carve out for each jurisdiction. So they did do a special study that just applied just to Fairfax and the other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So there was a component that was Fairfax yeah. specific, but yeah, but the ordinance, it may have been based on work from other jurisdictions, but the ordinance mm -hmm. itself was specifically tailored for, um, for yeah. Fairfax. Yeah. And I, I liked your, one of your earlier slides about the what the benefits of this would be, but would it would it be fair to say that just to put it in? And I know it's always dangerous to try to put anything in a few words when it's a full ordinance; it's all in, in writing. But that really this is a way of trying to to promote more lower income housing, as any other housing is built large housing, not and this exempts. Uh, individual houses or, as you said, even up to a triplex, but someone building an apartment house or a fourplex would have to put some money or some resources into Correct. making sure that Correct. we have some affordable yep. housing that comes out of that. That's sort of the summary of yep. what the purpose of this is. That, that's, that's, yeah, yep. that's good. Um, okay. I forget what my other, my other question was, but thank you. Vice Mayor. 
Yeah. Um, I, I may have been looking down when you said it, but I thought the minimum threshold was three units. It is. And I it think is. you said four plexus. It, it is three units. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So and just um, to clarify, before you were here, we went over the study at the council level. And at that point, it was the council's recommendation to make 15% for mm -hmm. rental and 20% for single family homes based on the study actually showing how that worked. And it was also the council's recommendation to go to the $3 for the square foot. Mm -hmm. But I have a question about, um, and I provided these to you earlier. I know in the staff report, you talk about the planning director administering the fund uh, mm -hmm. Don't you think it makes sense for the planning director to administer the fund with the finance director? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of mm -hmm. details to administering a special fund. And is is that contemplated in your mind? Yeah, I think that would naturally occur. Okay. So, well, yeah. I, you know, maybe I'm just the trust, but verify yeah. is mm -hmm. I have a lot of trust in you, but I, I do think our finance director, um, one of the questions I asked is how would the fund be administered? Mm -hmm. And um, he did respond on some areas just talking about um, you can't do this in life. It's, they don't allow this kind of revenue. Mm -hmm. Um you can't do a separate fund because there's not enough activity right now. And he's recommending that we do uh, something, a special deposit account in the building and planning Correct. fund for inclusionary housing fees. And then if we get a bunch of activity, then mm -hmm. we can justify doing a separate fund. So do, do you have anything to add to what he shared with me on that? No, I think that's a good approach. So, okay. he, and then another question, um, you know, in the discussion, I watched the planning commission meeting and it seemed to me it was more one commissioner was dealing, was really looking at very low and low income. And my question is, it's my understanding that one of the reasons why inclusionary fees haven't worked out that much and why some jurisdictions have lowered them that already have them. It's because it's really hard to pencil out mm -hmm. the very low moderate is also considered affordable housing, whether we like it or not, the very low and low income are very expensive to build because mm -hmm. of all the requirements from the grants and tax credits and because they're required to use prevailing wage. So, did any discussion come up? It's not just the flexibility of allowing moderate. Moderate housing can be a little cheaper to build, but I'm just wondering if you have anything to share with us on that, because when I saw it on the Planning Commission, it didn't appear to me that there was really an understanding that mm -hmm. there is a difference. And so by balancing it out for moderate, with some moderate, mm -hmm. you can get affordable housing because we don't want everybody just paying the fee. We want it to be built. Right. So, yeah. what do you what do you well, want to that, share that, on that? That? Does, that does come across in the fee study that if you're if there's no tax credit, I mean, if it, if you're just paying the full cost of the unit, then it's it's much cheaper just to do moderate because the funding gap is less. But from what I've heard from affordable housing providers over the years, it, it is easier to get tax credits and grants and those other things to build low and very not low. really if you yes. check out what happened with victory village not mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. the tax credits are very competitive they're mm -hmm. very hard to get and the grants i sit on a, a county committee that gives out mm -hmm. some of those grants mm -hmm. it's really competitive and there's not a whole lot of money out there so you've heard from affordable, I mean, maybe things have changed, but I've been sitting on this committee for a few years. Mm -hmm. You're hearing that they're very available. No, I mean it is. It is hard. We built a couple of projects up in Runner Park, and there was it was always a challenge to get the 
the that the gap financing was was the problem. So even if you were able to get the the tax credits, and then it's the then it used to be that the nine percent were the only ones that were hard to get, and then now the four percent are, are hard to get. So you're correct; it is harder to get tax credits now than it has been in the past. So okay, so is it your feeling that you know, as an expert in this field, that it would be a good idea? I mean, my personal opinion, it's a good idea to leave the moderate in there so you have the flexibility, yeah, yeah, but I think how are you thinking about this? No, I think it would be good to have all options on the table. So I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want you to tie your hands. Um, so. Okay. And then from what I understand from your presentation, any use of those fees would come to the council so you could make recommendations at that time. Mm -hmm how correct. the split should go, correct? Mm -hmm. So we have the option, or who's ever sitting on this council still has the option to say, I want more in the very low or low income, right? Right, and I think you could, and it, the way I've seen this work in, in other places is it sometimes you don't have a large, you know, kitty of money. And so, so you may not be able to kind of use it to build housing, but you can use it to help, you know, retrofit housing or you know construction so there's, so you can do a programs so there's a lot of flexibility in how you can use the money it just has to be used towards affordable housing um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be used to specifically build like an apartment complex okay well and one just one thing that happened with victory village is there was a huge funding gap and the mm -hmm. county was able to fill some of that funding gap with limit just a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. to get it over the the edge uh, with some housing trust money. So we don't necessarily have to build the whole thing, right. but we can offset some of the costs too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you can, the, the fund could be used to, you know, fill the gap if there is a funding gap. So. And um, thank you for adding that we could do other things like rehab or things yeah. like that. Yeah. I think that's really valuable. So thank mm -hmm. you for your presentation and thanks mm -hmm. for your work on this. I yep. appreciate it. Yep. Bet. Just wanted to add one thing, which is when MidPen um, was able to figure out how to uh, acquire Sherwood Oaks and remove that property from the speculative market, it's permanently affordable at 60% of AMI. But at that time, they're like, if you have these sorts of funds, you could buy further affordability to bring it to 50% mm -hmm. AMI or something like that. I mean, we don't, we didn't have it set up that infrastructure, but it, it could work to that end too, right? If there's preservation at play, you can almost buy yeah, affordability. Yeah you, could, yeah. you could, you could buy it down. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the, the one, the, the one, the only reason I'm hesitating is I, I can just, I'm envisioning how many units you're probably going to get built and it's, probably more in like the 20, 30, 40 units max. So you're, you're not going to have a huge war chest of funds. Totally. But, but but you will have some money. And so, but we can f figure out flexible way. That's why we don't want to hire, tie your hands because you want exactly. to be flexible to kind of maximize what money you do have. Yeah. As a small community, we need to yeah. be creative and be nimble when it comes, because it's, yeah. A lot of different tools in the toolbox are needed when there's not a lot of stuff being built. And yeah, mm -hmm. so. But yeah, but we do have a good cooperative relationship with other Marin County jurisdictions. So there could be some cooperative cooperation on building a project too. So the other thing is um, some housing trust monies for San Rafael and Novato were used uh, for some grants um, for Home Key. Mm -hmm. They were able mm -hmm. to do some, use a little bit of that. So I think there's, you know, this is great. It gives us a lot of things that we may be able to do in the future that we haven't been able to do. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. I would just say in one more thing, which is from the TAM, like transportation mm -hmm. authority perspective, um, conversations with like county board of supervisors or even regional agencies that are giving out funds, like even small contributions that can mm -hmm. be le like leveraged are meaningful in this sort of symbolic way too, that like we have skin in the game or we're putting up a little, even if it's not a big yeah. slice of the pie. Right. So um, that I, I've been hearing that more and more. So it, it, I think that's an alignment as well.
Yeah, I think I have heard that actually part of the reason it's been particularly competitive for tax credits in Marin is that we don't have sort of the local match for the most part um, that some other jurisdictions have. Um, and I think that San Rafael has been really you know, good at um, being able to leverage their um, local funding to help them help their uh, affordable projects get over the finish line. And we will never make that much money. Um, and people generally tell you you don't want to um, give the in lieu fee if you can help it because it's usually worth less than just getting the unit. But we do want to provide flexibility. And it seems like in larger jurisdictions, having that in lieu fee is going to get you more bang for the buck just because they produce a lot more. Um, but I think it's good to be flexible. Um, I'm curious who will be responsible for managing our inclusion, inclusionary housing portfolio. Should we get any units out of this? So it seems like you know Novato had a third party vendor, but I think other smaller jurisdictions maybe had the MHA or somebody administer their affordable housing portfolio that's developed from the inclusionary. Yeah, I, I don't think we've put a, a thought into that yet. So, I guess I guess yeah. later down the line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I initially, when I looked at this, I am concerned that we are required to build 149 very low income and 86 low income units, which is a large number of units. Um, however, it is true that in Marin, most of our very low and low income units don't come from inclusionary, they come from 100% affordable projects. Um, you know, so I, I, I am concerned, though, because it seems like um, we don't have a lot of land that's large enough to accommodate 100% affordable projects, and yet we still have to theoretically hit this goal. Um, so that's just a little concerning. Um, you know, the market doesn't really serve lower income folks. Um, but I'm wondering in terms of our um, inclusion or our in lieu, can those fees be used for things like rental subsidies or do they have to be built used for production? If we have the um, linkage fee or a uh, in lieu fee and it goes into an affordable housing trust. Yeah, I think you could use it to fund a, a program for towards affordable housing. So that would be a rental subsidy program. Right. And then, um, I don't know, it seems like with our, our moderate income, I mean, I'm, I'm glad we're having the flexibility. I'm wondering why a developer would provide lower, very low income units, unless there was an incentive to do so above and beyond. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure how that works. Um, and then there's one part that does confuse me a little that I wanted to clarify. It's 17.140.050, um, the duration of affordability covenants. And it says at the end of the 55 year term, the restrictions on rental of the inclusionary units may only be removed in the event that the property upon which the rental inclusionary units or units are located is rezoned and used for a non-residential use. It almost seems to imply that the units are affordable in perpetuity, even at the end of the 55 year term term. I'm not sure if I'm understanding this phrase. But that's one I might have to kick over to Kylie. Okay. So, And then the final one that I had just some questions about was about, um, you know, I, I kind of doubt that anyone's going to build some offsite units um, because they don't want to build them on the site that they're mm -hmm. developing just because we're probably going to have really small developments anyway. It was just interesting to see that the offsite units need to be no farther than one half mile from the main project site, but they can't be within a quarter mile of a fifty plus, a uh, fifty plus affordable units. And I'm kind of thinking in a town like Fairfax, it's about two miles long. I'm kind of like, where would they do this? But I, I like I said, I doubt that we'll have that many offsite units. I, I actually had a question about that: whether that was intended to mean that it would be in Fairfax, or whether that distance. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be in San Anselmo or San Geronimo. Yeah, I think it was mostly you. You have to provide an alternative means of compliance, and so that was the intent there. What was the intention of that of that paragraph that the if it was built on an off site that uh, on a separate site that that site would have to be in Fairfax? That's, that's I think my that was the intent. I'd yeah. I'd have to go back and look at it to make sure that we didn't uh wasn't clear to me yeah. when i read it so it might be something yeah. that needed to be yeah. just words to yeah. make it clear and we have kylie online here good evening kylie thanks for being with us of course thank you for having me um a couple of questions i heard that i could address um first you asked uh why would a developer want to do a low or very low when they could do a moderate just to meet our ordinance? 
Uh, one of the reasons why they may want to do that is they could then take advantage of density bonus and those kick in at a higher rate when they're low or very low. So that's one reason why you, even though it seems on its face that it looks like we're maybe only targeting moderate, it really gives them the flexibility to be able to utilize all the tools in their capability <laughs> that the state legislature has given them and density bonus being the greatest one of that. As to your question on 17140.050, the reason for that subsection B was basically to say that if it is a rental affordable project, it is gonna stay a rental affordable project unless it's, it's kind of turned over and that land is no longer something that you want to be rental. It's different for the for sale inclusionary because those we have covenants on and the 55 years was selected, although you kind of, I don't know if that's really one of your questions. It was selected to make sure that it was legally defensible. That was um, a, across the board where we could kind of know that we were legally sound. And then the last question was, um, it was not designed to have them go out of Fairfax. What it was designed to do in having that separate or making them close, but not too intense is you don't want to create pockets in Fairfax where this is where all the affordable houses go. So it's meant to separate them. If, if you don't want to do it in your project, you have to do it within a certain distance of your project and you don't want to put it where there's a pocket. That was why those, those were delineated. If you think those um, numbers don't work with Fairfax, we can of course change them, but that was the purpose and the logic behind those ordinance language as to why we were trying to accomplish. Great, thanks. I guess I was sort of looking at it and saying, well, we want to have things centered in the uh, main strip, not up in the hills where there's fires. Um, and we want to have things close to downtown so it's walkable and whatnot. And yet we have 80 units of affordable housing now at Sherwood Oaks and we have Vest Pocket and then we have Bennett House. And so there's a lot of affordable housing downtown. And then it almost seems like then we'd have to put it way out somewhere. Um, so I was just curious about how that stacks up. Thanks. Yeah, and if that's something the council doesn't, think is important, we can, of course, change it. That was the purpose of why that language was put in. If if you don't think that is a concern to have a, um, you want to, you want to put it in a place like downtown so that it is walkable and it's more usable, we can, of course, redraft and pull that out. That's not problematic, but that was at least the um, rationale as to why it was put in. Yeah, I get you. You don't want to concentrate um, low-income households unfairly, so that's great. I just was kind of curious. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a follow-up question, Kylie, and I think uh, Liesl actually answered it. I mean, we want to be careful of affirmatively furthering fair housing and not concentrating all low income together. That's inconsistent with that goal. So my feeling is even though it might be a little awkward, uh, I think we we personally should leave that in unless there's something... I, I don't think we should change it, but it, do yeah. you have something to add to that, Kylie? Because to me, AFFH, we're going to get into problems if we start. I, I like the way it was written, but what do you think? Well, I do. I don't know what AF, it, with the one acronym you just used. I'm not sure what that is, but I do know that with environmental justice. Affirmatively uh, furthering fair housing oh, is a requirement. And so you don't want to create areas where you're just concentrating all the low income people in one area. Right. And environmental justice, um, that whole line of study and thinking says that you want to diversify both all of your income categories. You don't want to have conglomerates of it because then it becomes more problems occur in that area. If you diversify it, then it's more environmentally sensitive for all the people that are in there. So um, if that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I do have another question since we're still working on questions. So if, for example, the issue that was just being talked about where, uh, say you have a situation in which the requirements of, of where the, uh, a separate, uh, couple of units could be built just didn't fit there was any way to do it could would would a mechanism like a variance uh be possible where the planning commission could actually 
say, okay, we can make an exception to this, like like a variance? Would there be a, a, a mechanism for that? I don't, you probably couldn't make the findings for a variance to let somebody out of the affordable housing requirement. But I'm, I'm could, saying about a specific thing, like it has to be within this many miles. Yeah, I think that's what, you, it would have to be within this alternative means of compliance. So there's a little bit of flexibility kind of built into the code here where you could probably get get at that type of thing. Um, because the the... Um, trying to see who the approval authority is here. So the town could agree to this alternative means of compliance. So you you could they could come up with the affordable housing plan, and then they could bring it to the the town council, and then you could approve this alternative way of meeting the inclusionary housing requirement. And you have and to make I it. Yeah, yeah. Go go ahead, Kylie. I didn't mean to interrupt. If I could add to that, I, I think that um, under the scenario you just said, and I agree with what Jeff's saying, if we were to look at the offsite development of affordable units section, it, set, it talks about over concentration. And let's say you did have over 50 deed restriction units in there, but there was a good reason why the council decides that this was a location that makes sense and it's not actually over concentration the council could make um, findings showing why it is not and then basically allowing it to occur. I think there's a lot of flexibility that you have um, with these alternative means that if it doesn't seem to fit with the scenario, we would just, we would figure out the way to work around it to make it work for Fairfax. It's not to, this is not trying to stop affordable housing. It's trying to encourage it in a way that makes sense for Fairfax. At the point in time that a specific project came in, uh, Janet and I would help with planning, figuring out how we're going to navigate that through what we have. I think you already have a lot of flexibility, but if we needed more, we could figure that out. All right, and the, and the offsite development of affordable units. I, it seems like those those uh, specifications of mileage only apply to those, and I have a feeling that they're probably unlikely to be that common anyway. So maybe we we're just belaboring this point too much. But thank you very much. No, and that but that response was actually helpful to know that there's flexibility in how you make findings. Cause I think your point's really well taken, Councilmember Blash, about, you know, you want smart transit oriented infill, but if you end up in a situation where you can't put um, you know, affordable units and people don't want to have cars, but you have to put them in a different area of town get problematic. So it's good to hear that there's some flexibility there. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you for, for answering that question. Of course. Are we ready to open the public hearing on this item? Okay, we will do so. Uh, the public hearing on this item is open. If anyone wants to um, provide public comment, okay. I, I do think that it's, a, it's, it's quite dangerous to to do that thing where they concentrate it. I've seen it in Germany and France, and it's a disaster. Uh, 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 they have a very good social system, but they did mess this up quite badly. I mean, especially in France with the banlieues, where there's these areas where they're all concentrated in one spot, and it really does not work. I think it's a terrible idea. And also, I think that the banlieues themselves were highly uh they didn't have to build them like that this soviet style uh, brutalist architecture they could have done it in a different manner and they didn't do it and they were uh, also they were done in these like large high rise fashions um i don't i don't particularly understand why duplexes uh, maybe you can enlighten me on this i don't know why duplexes are not part of are considered part of this thing the minimum it has to have 3 or something like that uh, I live in an arrangement like that where it's just two, you know. So I, I, I think that's kind of an interesting idea. I've seen it in Toronto and stuff. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, also know what linkage is exactly. So that would be nice to be um, told about that a little bit more. Um, anyway, so, but yeah, I do think that uh, concentration is a serious matter. And I do think um, a lot of people are really offended by Wind Cup. I don't know really why. I've looked at it a billion times. I can't figure out why people are so upset about the thing. I mean, I, I'm used to it because I've seen it in Berlin like that. Uh, maybe it's the aesthetics. People don't, they don't appreciate it. But I think it can be built. Um, I think that these places could be redesigned in a fashion that's less brutalistic or something like that. That's, that's just my input. <laughs> 
Thank you for your comment. Hello, Council. Um, I appreciate the want for the inclusionary fees. And I'll be the first one to say, since I've spoken to many people coming to me and soliciting about doing something on my property, that there's a need for that. I'll also accept, before I make my comment, that the reason we're doing this is so you can get away from a, a subjective approach so you won't get sued when you treat people differently. But when we have all this flexibility, you're incorporating that same subjectivity that would defeat the purpose of having an ordinance. So you either have an ordinance that's very tight or you don't. I certainly think that there should be a carve out because I agree that our density wants to be around the central part of the town where we don't need additional transportation. But for all the housing that's built, the real objective here is to get something built. At the end of the day, who cares how, when, where, why? We want to get it built. And every time you add a layer of regulation, bureaucracy, and difficulties, it delays the project, it increases the cost of the project, it knocks out certain people. And even I'm, Barbara brought some really good points up at the beginning. There's now a new effort to go and for some of these bonds and funds available, actually bringing forth suit, as you saw with Marin City against the Board of Supervisors saying, hey, we don't want you to authorize those funds. We don't want those bonds to be released. So again, if we're doing this, I think you need to have something that's really clear so you can't be challenged on something subjectively. And you want to make sure that you have as little regulation as you can so you can encourage building and accept it when it comes to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Todd Greenberg. You know, I'm just amazed at how complicated you want to make things and how much you want to tax this population. It's a tax by any other name, but I'm going to read from the staff report so that the rest of Fairfax can know what's really going on here. This is a on uh, paragraph two, uh, paragraph four of page two. A development impact fee is defined as a monetary exaction, other than a tax or a special assessment. Now, somehow, somebody here seems to think that Fairfax is made of money. Have any of you? I don't know if anyone here has looked at the census, the U.S. census recently for Fairfax. Are you aware of what the average income is in Fairfax? I mean, you've got a lofty ambition to provide housing for everybody that needs it. But I'm going to give you the stats here that I just got from census.gov. The average per capita income in Fairfax in 2021 dollars is $59,011. The average household earns 111,000. Now I'm gonna refer to page three here. That means that the average annual income per person per capita, according to census.gov, is very low in Fairfax. It's under the very low, 63,950. So I gotta ask you, are you seeking to provide affordable housing built out throughout Fairfax and free housing for everybody, because I want to sign up. Most of the households will qualify for this too. What you're doing is increasing the cost of building throughout Fairfax through so many ways. You are stymieing the free market and making it possible for only affordable housing care providers with big lawyers and big budgets to take over building in this town. You are not doing the general population a favor. You are giving a free ride to people like Midpen Housing, which has $1.7 billion that pays $67,000 less property tax to the Fairfax and 200 plus thousand less than the prior owner to the state of California. This is not the right way to go about providing housing. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Mark Bell. I'm kind of curious, like what people at the Good Earth make, because according to these figures, uh, you have to be making $34 an hour to be considered very low income. I'm sure there are a lot of people in town who aren't making that. And so what's affordable? You know, we always hear, oh, you know, like the, you know, the guys who are washing the dishes, the guys who are doing the prep, you know, we need housing for them. I don't think they're making $34 an hour. And as far as finding places besides downtown, where are you going to build? Can't build up in the hills. If you build up in the hills, people need cars just to go get their groceries. Can't just bicycle bike the whole time so i don't know there's just some things to consider you know some of the stuff that you come up with really doesn't make any sense when you look at real world economics thank you for your comment and anyone on zoom sorry um Yes, the first speaker is Ava, and Ava, you're unmuted now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to point out, we've heard repeated references to what's happening in Germany and France, and we heard the architecture of the banlieue uh, described as brutalist, um, and the question asked by the speaker was, why do they make it? They don't have to make it like that. Well, the reason they made it like that is because the Banyu have been populated by the people who were, you know, coming from the colonized countries. So there was a very clear racial element, and that should not be ignored when you're discussing um, the Banyu or the the architecture. Um, but um, when when you only look at Europe and you don't look at Asia. Um, you have a lot of high-rise buildings in Asia, in Asian countries uh, that work out very, very well for people. Um, and you don't have, I'm not going to say there isn't homelessness um, in, say, Taiwan. There is, but uh, there's much less of it. Um, and that's because you can build up. Obviously, that's not going to happen in Marin County. Uh, there would be too much pushback. But it's important to, to think about these things, um, you know, over the long term. Um, I agree about the affordability. Um, it's, it's a bit of a ruse. Affordable housing isn't really affordable for people like me. Um, and then I do want to just just to bring the point home a little bit more. Uh, the recent hanging death um, in the Marin County Jail uh, was uh, a young man who uh, grew up a few miles from you guys. and. Um, volunteered at the San Geronimo um, Valley Community Center. Um, he was 21 years old. Uh, he was in that um, jail. That was his housing for eight months. It's an underground jail. And he was found hanged on Sunday. Thank you for your comment, Ava. The next, the next speaker is Mallory. Mallory, you're unmuted now. Hi. Um, just because we're talking about affordable housing and I've been on this committee for, I don't know how many years, I just want to bring awareness to people who are listening to this, that we don't meet. We're just in name only. I think we've met once in the last five years. And, um, I think that should change or, uh, not use the idea that we do have an affordable housing committee because we don't. And it, it's only in name only. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further speakers on Zoom. Okay. We'll close the public hearing on this item and take it back to the dais. Um, I'm happy to make a motion. Okay. Can I address a oh. question from the public first? Um, you know, there was a question about um, not really understanding the linkages fee. And I mean, I think the way that I encapsulated this for myself was that the um, inclusionary, um, the in-lieu fee is really a fee that 
a person could pay in lieu of providing an affordable unit when they were developing a multi-unit building. And the um, linkage fee is a fee that would be charged to a business that was um, a, a business of, about, I think, 5,000 square feet, um, which I think is unlikely to be developed here anyway. But um, so the linkage fee is for um, new building, new new uh, businesses, new commercial sites um, to sort of defray the costs of bringing you know more people into Fairfax. And the um, in lieu fee is the fee that a developer of housing would pay so they could get out of providing an affordable unit. Cause I, I know that was kind of like confusing and there's a lot to read in these ordinances. Um, and then I think there was a question about why duplexes can't be um, part of this. And I think part of that is just because if somebody's just building a duplex um, it would be harder for them to uh, make one of those units affordable than um, somebody who's building four or plus units. So um um, yes, yeah, three. I'm sorry, three plus units. Um, so I think you know there has to be a cutoff somewhere. But I'm doing my best here. Thank you. So thank you, Councilmember Blash. That was very helpful. So I'd like to make a motion to introduce way first reading and read by title. Oh, do I need to do these three separate, or can I do them together? Yeah. Well, um, you can do them together. It, it's okay. I'll do them together. So, introduce way first reading and read by title only an ordinance adding chapter 17.140 affordable housing to title 17 zoning of the Fairfax Municipal Code relating to inclusionary housing requirements. Adopt a resolution adopting affordable housing requirements and program regulations and adopt a resolution adopting affordable housing in lieu fees and commercial slash non-residential linkage fees in the master schedule and using the supplement that was provided tonight. There's a second. Second. Great motion, Kohler, second, Blash. Could I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Ackerman? Yes. Council Member Hellman? Yes. Council Member Blash? Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler? Yes. And Mayor Catrano? Yes. All ayes, motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Really good presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, what time is it? Uh, we still have time. Let's uh, move on here to the consent calendar. The council may approve the entire consent calendar with one action or vote. In the alternative, items on consent may be removed by any town council or staff member for separate discussion. Public comment for items on consent happens all at once rather than after each individual item. During the public comment period on consent items, speakers may comment on any items from this section of the agenda. Each speaker will have up to two minutes and may only speak once. Um, so we'll have public, well, any Questions or comments on the consent? There's one I do. for, okay, for item 10 at least, right? So do you want to take that now, Janet? Sure, I will. <laughs> so pursuant to the Brown Act on item 10, I would like to read into the record out loud that the total um, base salary for the town manager, if item 10 is uh, adopted, as of July 1st, 2023, will be $237,052.52. Okay. Thank you for capturing that. Um, questions on consent? Yeah, I clarified a typo on the August 2 minutes that Michelle has. And I'm sorry, that was on... Item number seven. And then item number 14, I just wanted to clarify that I had a recurring conflict for the MCCMC uh, homeless subcommittee. So I was not able to make it. And it's certainly not as a result of any lack of interest. So just wanted to declare that for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or we can open up public comment? Um, okay. I just wanted to clarify, if I can, I don't know if this is the right time, that um, there has been um, 
a comment made on Nextdoor that I am now the representative to the MCCMC uh, Homeless Committee, um, and there are actually two representatives from town um, on it now. So um, I'm not the sole representative or the sole voice on homelessness for the town of Fairfax. I just want to make sure people know that. And the mayor, Mayor Catrano, is has been on it for quite some time, correct? Yes, I'm I'm currently serving as the co-chair of that that regional committee of electives. Right. Uh, so that announcement that um, council member um, Hellman made about her um, recurring conflict with that meeting and then my being appointed, that's why I'm bringing this up because it, I think that that um, item in the consent calendar was misconstrued in some way. So thank you. Thank you for that clarification. As it appears, most things are these days. <laughs> with that said, we will... Um, hold any further comments and then we'll instead go to public comment on consent. So if you have any uh, comments, this will be the time and then we'll go to folks on Zoom and you can raise your hand on Zoom at this time and we'll get to you after comments in the room. Hi, Todd Greenberg. Uh, I'm really concerned about how you treat the public. This consent calendar has been abused by this council for quite some time. Now, I didn't know what the rules were for a consent calendar, so I looked them up and I've surveyed different jurisdictions and I've inquired here with the town clerk as to what the policies are here and the policies aren't published. All there, all, all that exists apparently is what is on this meeting agenda. Michael McIntosh has inquired and asked you questions and asked you to define for the public so that they know what your rules are. You need to be a lot more clear because you're being accused of violations by many people that don't think it's right. It's your duty to represent the public properly. And there's a big question. There's multiple questions about whether you're doing so properly. That being said, on this consent calendar tonight, there's 11 items. You're allowing me 10.9 seconds to speak per item. I'm asking you to pull consent calendar item number 10, I would like to comment and I would like you to answer questions that I and other people have about the compaction amendment to the town manager, Heather Abrams employment agreement, because it's not clearly spelled out. I would like two minutes at the end of this to speak on it. If you don't let me, you're denying my right to free speech. Um, there's a big question as to how much the fiscal impact will be, whether this is a retroactive or a future ratchet mechanism for a raise that is not part of her actual contract. Has anyone done the math? I would like to see different scenarios here. I think it's your duty, if you're fiscally minded, to see different scenarios here. I also have a question here relative to the finance director's report that says the town manager's budget is 274,000 for the year versus what was just commented 236,000. What is the discrepancy, please? Okay, thank you. I understand salary compaction. And, and the thing is, is what, what I'm curious is about what staff member um, under her authority actually has a wage that's close to hers at all. In relation, I think that there was an amendment SB 216 or something like that in California that said that uh, there would be a 10% differential. So I don't know. It would be interesting to know uh, what what salary is even close to hers because it seems pretty large. Thank you for that comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Mark Bell. And as Todd said, you're in violation of the Brown Act by allowing 11 something seconds to comment on each item. That's not what the Brown Act is. And it's actually not even what you ran on. When you ran your campaigns, why didn't you say, uh, we really don't believe in transparency. We're gonna do everything we can, like by sticking the consent calendar at the end and then cutting your ability to comment on it to nothing. But uh, going on to the financials, um, says $325,000 allocated to the attorney. 
I actually read it wrong. I thought we had spent 325000 already for the year. But actually, it said that we haven't spent anything. So I guess our attorney's been working for free. Uh, you sure you want to put that in consent that no, that there's a mistake? Uh, Perry Park stabilization, 45000 Was that for, what was that for? Women's Club Rehab, 50000 for what? For that stove? For a for a, a dishwasher that uses phantom power when it's finished its cycle. Uh, One hundred ninety thousand for downtown improvements. Which improvements are those? I mean, these are things that you know we should be talking about. Uh, landscaping thirty thousand. Where? I thought we had a public works who did uh, who who did that kind of stuff. California infrastructure ninety six thousand dollars for what? What did they do? Bruce Enterprises, ten thousand dollars. I didn't recognize the name. What was the ten thousand dollars for? And there's still no list of any type of credit card payments. So I mean, I'm sure that the town has credit cards. So why aren't those uh, uh, expenditures being included on this? I mean, you're looking, you're con you're consenting to stuff that's wrong, unexplained. With and giving the public like 10 seconds to comment, these are violations. You should be ashamed of yourself. Thank you, Mark. Next speaker, please. Yep. Sadly, I also have nothing positive to say about the consent calendar, and it's really something that I, I tried to take the time and I compiled some information that had been slurring around, and I sent that to you. And I didn't have the even the decency to get a response back. Very simple questions. Excuse me. Okay, Liesl may have responded back. I apologize, Liesl, because I didn't recall that. And in just in fairness, for the last correspondence that I sent out on different subjects, I did receive something back from Stephanie Abiet, maybe um, not the most favorable, but Liesl has been extremely responsive. Back to the consent cal calendar. I kind of have a, a funny question, and I really want you to think about this. So if the consent calendar is precluding the general public from hearing your conversation about a subject, okay, and that's why you're going to put on consent. But if you have not had the opportunity to have that discussion and have public input, input and discuss it among yourselves, then are you voting in the dark? Or are you even educated really on this subject except that you're relying on a staff report that doesn't necessarily come from your constituents, from the community, or from a general conversation among yourselves that supposedly is supposed to bring in your collective experience and intelligence. So to me, if you're voting on something without having that discussion, that's kind of a violation of the rules. And if you don't allow the conversation in the public, that's kind of a violation of the rules. And I'm sure we could even weave this in out of the Brown Act to say that this is a violation. So I really kind of ask a real question to think about what you're doing. If you're not having a conversation with the public, you're not having a conversation with yourself, then how could you, in your right mind, vote on something when you're relying, supposedly, if you're following the rules, to a staff report that's made by somebody that doesn't live in your community. Isn't that a violation of what you guys stand for also? So do think about that. Thanks. Thank you. Any folks online? Yes, there is one raised hand and it is Ava. You're unmuted now. Thanks. I wanted to just provide a little bit of context here. Um, this is a small town um, and it meets not that regularly. Um, it's, it's a little more understandable that there are so many items on the consent calendar. Um, I think it would be helpful and, and I, I understand why people are upset about it, but I think it'd be helpful if um, people who attend these meetings regularly would attend the County Board of Supervisors meetings because um, you know, the, the, um, the lack of transparency is much more pronounced there. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that gets buried 
uh, not only in consent, but you really have to parse through every single document uh, to, to find anything. Um, in that regard, I would just quickly point out um, that the presentation, the numbers we heard today from Gary Naja Reese, um, you know, I've been c running CPRAs uh, about uh, his office and, uh, and it's very, very hard um, to get any documents to prove the numbers that he claims because, you know, they can always claim privacy. And that's really, that's really a problem because Gary said that he was going to solve. No, no, this is, this is not on consent. I, I understand so this. I'm just trying to provide some keep context. It on topic. Yeah. I'll try to keep it on topic, but Jimmy Sanders died last July. He was a black military veteran and I begged for over a year for them to get him housed and and he was allowed to perish on the streets. Uh, you know, so there is a there is a problem throughout the county with transparency. It's not just this town council. Thank you. Thank you. No further hands on Zoom. OK, we will close public comment on the consent calendar. And. Yeah, I just um, wanted to um, first thank Gio. I mean, obviously he didn't stay um, till the end here. And we thanked everyone on the volunteer board that uh, is, you know, pr presently serving or had been recently serving, but also there are plenty of past folks that are incredible volunteers to this day. Um, so just kudos to everyone on the volunteer board. And I know we're going to pick up a lot of that work that the volunteer board was holding on our Parks and Rec Commission, on our Open Space Committee, um, et cetera. But yeah, my gratitude to, as a former volunteer board member, uh, yeah, a lot of gratitude. I also wanted to say um, just generally, like this consent calendar has a lot of like pretty run-of-the-mill items on it. Um, I think there are a couple items related to, you know, pay that, it's great to have questions and we can always ask questions of staff on consent. Um, people can always send questions in advance um, on items on consent as well. You don't have to use 10 seconds per item in, in the meeting itself, um, but we could answer questions leading up to the meeting or there can be clarifying questions or specific comments that could be made at the meeting as well. So. Just wanted to share that there are a lot of other ways that you can engage with some of these items but um yeah i think it's great to have some of these reports i think it's great to have the proclamations um wanted to give a shout out to Kristen amelie um, our representative to the marine commission on aging for um reaching out about doing this proclamation for ageism awareness day uh and yeah just wanted to say thanks for for bringing all these great items. I make a motion to approve consent calendar. Sure. I move to approve the count like consent calendar. And we did do I get a second? Item. Second, I'll second. Okay, motion Hellman, second Kohler to approve the consent calendar. Uh, can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Council Member Hellman. Yes. Council Member Blash. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yeah. Mayor Catrano. Yes. All eyes motion or uh, consent calendar passes. Thank you very much. And um, just a quick um, comment. I know you mentioned it earlier, Council Member Hellman, but I didn't know if you want to get something in the hopper for future agenda items related to how we. Yes. Having a more of a localized um, engagement, you know subcommittee or ad hoc committee, whatever you want. But yeah, have some discussion around what that would look like. would be great. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we can put that on our like future agenda forecast and figure out a date in the next couple of meetings. Um, I have another agenda topic too. Sure. Um, I'd like us to explore implementation for just cause eviction and tenant protect, well, both tenant protection policies. Okay. We will, um, add that to the agenda forecast. Um, Tom, Tom Manager's report. Uh, 
sorry. Yeah, add it to the agenda forecast. So it'll just be in the list of possible agenda items that um, the next mayor will decide on. Like the next, uh, for upcoming council meetings, not the next meeting, but for future agenda items, just generally. There's no, it was just a recommendation. That's going to be every meeting for the rest of the year, the housing element. But uh, yeah, please. Well, this this item part, tonight is part of the housing element. Could we have a, the, the, the town yeah, manager's report to address the housing element? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention that we will um, we have been working hard to update the housing element schedule and we will be um, putting that uh, updated draft schedule on our website so everyone can follow along. A lot of progress has been made and there are still some um, critical path issues to um, complete before the housing element is completely finished. And I was wondering if you could clarify, um, at one point we were facing a legal suit about our housing element and has anything happened with that? Yes, so yes. the um, suit against us by Yimby has been dismissed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we will adjourn this meeting Before you do, in memory of Diane I, Feinstein. 